It's always exciting to approach a new audience, and particularly an audience with such youthful flavor as this audience. Now, those of you who are 60 and above and very academic in your disposition will appreciate that youthful compliment you just received. I hope today that you will participate rather than simply listening to someone who has spent 30 years in research in this area and investigation at Glen Rose over the last eight and a half years, uh, rather than simply listening to what uh, I and the 50-odd uh, scientific scholars and engineers who are part of our uh, consultation base have learned, I'd rather that you have a discovery experience today. At Glen Rose, we make a lot of discoveries. We're involved in excavations that have, as one PhD said, literally turned the world upside down. Two of the nation's leading evolutionary scholars have admitted that if we can academically verify that man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously, that totally destroys any plausible mechanism for evolutionary development. For if man existed by evolutionary standards 108 million years ago, along with the dinosaurs at Glen Rose, without any precursors, without any life forms leading up, or if, according to the more accurate data, both of them existed just a few thousand years ago, either way, it totally destroys the concept of evolution. By nature, I'm a skeptic. Now, I want you to know that I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible academically, literally, and personally. But I want you to know that I haven't always believed the Bible. I, at one time, had very strong atheistic persuasion. Now, I don't say that with any sense of pride, but I'm saying that to underscore the fact that you also have the right to be skeptical. I hope today you'll not simply take everything that I say and uh, accept it immediately, even though it'll be truthful, it'll be accurate. I hope you'll research it. But beyond that, I hope you will have a discovery experience. That's the very best mode of education. Rather than the teacher simply displaying what he knows, it's better that he lead the students to discover, discover things for themselves that satisfy the deepest needs of the human mind and heart. The four great questions of life. They are, who am I? Where did I come from? What's my purpose here? And where am I going? Now, those are academic questions. Incidentally, the answer to those, the answers to those are found exclusively in the Bible. Science cannot answer those adequately. But science and philosophy can explore certain areas and come to certain conclusions, which I hope you'll share with me today. These four great questions are, who am I? You're a very unique individual. Who am I? We must address that. Are we simply, as one philosopher said, a speck of a fly taking a dizzy ride on a giant cartwheel? Or are we a unique individual created and designed in the image of God? Yes, we are. Who am I? Where did I come from? That's life origins. Where did I come from? How'd you get here? I don't mean what route you took to this lovely auditorium. I mean instead, how did life begin? How are you identified with that? And I hope to answer much of that today. Thirdly, what's my purpose here? We must have a purpose. We're not satisfied without a purpose. And lastly, where am I going? And there are only two alternatives to that. And that's academic as well. That's not simply religious. I want this to be a discovery experience for you, and I hope you'll be able to answer those questions more definitely after these hours of discussion than preceding them. Now, I hope some of you will get so involved in what you hear today that you'll want to come down and participate in the excavations at Glen Rose, or at least observe the data that is assimilated, much of it original data, at the Creation Evidences Museum. This past week, we had eight individuals from NASA visit the museum. Two days later, we had 25 people from Russia visit the museum. And then, three days after that, 
We had 20 people from Canada visit the museum. And once in a while in between, a Texan will trickle in. <laughs> in the museum, which my very fine colleagues who made introductions and arrangements for this seminar have visited quite often, we are in temporary quarters. I trust someone in this audience will be so moved with the evidence that you will help us get permanent quarters. And whether it's someone in this live audience or someone watching on video or listening on tape later, if you would like to be involved in what has been termed the greatest scientific experiment in the history of the world, that is the creation of the world's first hyperbaric biosphere simulating the conditions before the flood or the conditions that produce the fossil record. If you'd like to help us do that, we need the funding. Let us know. And this is not a commercial. This is a desperate appeal. Now, one of NASA's former experts, the systems engineer for a very special program, the most successful program that NASA admittedly has ever um, followed in its total procedure, said that that hyperbaric biosphere is more important than all of the work NASA has ever done put together. And I think he has pretty clear thinking on the subject. So we hope to sell a lot of issues in that hyperbaric biosphere. A couple of hours into the seminar today, you'll understand why the biosphere is so important. One further detail and we'll get down to business. At the conclusion of the seminar, you will have presented to you actual artifacts supporting the principles and technological investigation of what I'm going to talk to you about today in the conflict between creation and evolution. You will see one of the actual human footprints excavated among dinosaur footprints. That totally destroys the concept of evolution. You will see in turn a tooth, Hesperopithecus man, used by reference in the famous Scopes Evolution Trial in Dayton, Tennessee. And that's the trial that introduced evolution into the public school system. And incidentally, we're not afraid of the concept of evolution. I used to be an evolutionist. I think every intelligent individual ought to know the tenets of the evolutionary concept. But simultaneously, he should have presented to him academically the evidence on the other side. And there are only two plausible concepts. Stephen Jay Gould, the leading exponent of evolutionary theory, recently stated in print, and others have verified this over long years of academic research, there are only two concepts. It is either natural evolutionary development, that's called uniformitarianism, I don't want to get too technical, but all of those in the front row can get this, can't you? That is the concept that all the processes that are occurring today have occurred in the past and everything can be explained by naturalistic interpretation. Darwinism, in essence, the concept of naturalistic evolutionary development or the concept of special scientific creationism. And I hope to show you today which is the very superior model. I'll be showing you a tooth from Hesperopithecus. That's the Nebraska man which turned out to be a pig. I'll be showing you a human finger from excavations at Glen Rose. It's a feminine finger. And the girl stood about six feet, three inches tall. Is there a girl here today, six feet, three inches tall, who lost a finger near Glen Rose? Any takers? I, I hope not, because that finger is priceless. It's a fossilized specimen that uh, destroys a lot of evolutionary concept. And then, in conclusion, I will later, and the reason we're using this at the end of the seminar is to keep you from leaving. <laughs> at the conclusion of the presentation of these evidences, I will show you a hammer deposited by evolutionary concept at the very bottom of the geologic column, yet this hammer is so sophisticated it cannot be reproduced or fabricated by our best scientists today in our current atmospheric conditions. Hope that'll keep you till the end of the program, whether you're watching or you're here in person. Let me introduce the two concepts. First, the naturalistic concept. 
I think that you should be aware that the human mind thinks naturalistically and the human mind attempts to shun interpretation of divine creation. Charles Darwin did that. The reason Charles Darwin is so important is not that he came up with original thought. Now, in case you're taking notes, this is the first very important thing uh, that is worth taking down. Charles Darwin did not come up with original data. Charles Darwin borrowed from his own grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. He borrowed from the ancient Greeks. He borrowed from naturalistic thinking. He leaned heavily on Lyellian concept. And none of what he did in research was original. Oh, he took a few insects, classified them, but the work that he did could essentially be done by a high school freshman today. And yet, Charles Darwin was extremely brilliant. Well, if he didn't have any original scientific data, why do all modern academic evolutionists refer to Charles Darwin? This is the concept expressed as Darwinism, naturalistic interpretation of life origins, that about 600 million years ago, the trilobites began to express themselves in evolutionary development, and that is what we call the early stages of the Paleozoic era. Depending on what your academic background is and your purpose might be, you may want to take that down or you may want to just ignore it and say, well, they know what they're talking about. I'll wait till it gets to something more interesting. I know I speak to audiences regularly and I get tuned out regularly, so I'm giving you an excuse to tune things out. How many are already tuned out? <laughs> well, might I ask if anyone is tuned in yet? Is anyone tuned in? Good, good. You're responsive, and I hope that continues throughout the day. The Paleozoic era is introduced by the Cambrian period, and uh, that was approximately, according to evolutionary concept, approximately expressed about 600 million years ago. That progresses through eras, <coughs> the Paleozoic era, the periods and epochs, up to the Mesozoic era, which introduces the dinosaurs. That was about 228 million years ago, and finally closed about 64 million years ago, according to evolutionary concept, when the dinosaurs died out or were destroyed by some cataclysm. And that introduced the Cenozoic era, which finally culminated with man at the top. Now that is Darwinian evolutionary concept expressed in various forms. The current academic approach to that is punctuated equilibria. That means that it was not a gradual development as Darwin proposed, but it uh, grew by spurts and leaps and recesses and uh, a rapid evolutionary process. But I hope to show you within the next hour that any process of evolution other than variation within the genetic code, any process of evolution is absolutely impossible, scientifically impossible. In fact, I want to make a statement. The greatest scientific statement written in the history of the world is, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's a scientific statement. I hope to show you within the next couple of hours that it is the greatest scientific statement written in the history of the world. It is possible that the Lord himself, our creator, made other statements that were more scientific or as scientific, but in written text, it is the greatest scientific statement in the history of the world. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And that's academic, scientific. Why is Charles Darwin so important? Are you awake? Charles Darwin did not come up with original data, but he came up with an original thought, a very brazen thought that is common to every mind in this audience today. Modern evolutionary concept refers back to Darwin not because of the scientific research that he did, but because of a very revolutionary naturalistic thought process that his phobic mind produced. 
A phobic mind is a mind bent on chaos and disarray. Every person in this audience is plagued by phobias. You didn't know that I knew you so well, did you? I know because I'm a living human being myself. I've been down the road. We all are plagued with phobias. Sometimes we overcome them, sometimes we do not. Charles Darwin lived a phobic life that in today's economy could not have supported itself. In fact, he was supported by the resources from his father and his grandfather. He could not produce a living. He was essentially uh, non-capable of getting by and making a living for his family. He was non-productive. He was subject to his phobias and fears. He felt that his father smothered his mother to death just for the fact that his father was over six feet tall and his mother was a short lady. Charles Darwin so admired worms and so identified with worms crawling in the sand and the muck that he could not bring himself to uh, thread a worm on a fish hook. But he liked to fish, but he couldn't bait the hook as a grown man. Yet, while he had such a phobia and was afraid to bait a hook, afraid that he would harm the worm with which he identified, he at the same time took great relish in shooting birds. He shot every bird he could because those birds represented divine order, complexity, and design. And that's what he reflected from. Why is Charles Darwin so important? If he was so phobic, so non-productive, you wouldn't want him to be in your family. That's right. If he were a long-lost cousin, you would leave him long lost. You wouldn't want to be around the guy with all his phobias. Why is he so important? He tapped in on a thought common to all of us naturalistically, and it is this, that everything is the result of natural processes, and we do not have to give an account to a personal creator whom we resent. Charles Darwin resented a personal creator as imposing himself on his life because he resented the way God behaved. He resented that God would make worms to writhe in the dust in contrast to birds that could fly in the air, that God would make innocent children suffer. God never makes innocent children suffer. All of that is satisfied deeply in theological dissertation and satisfied in academic research. A God who would bring plagues. God does not bring plagues on the world in the sense of bringing them just to be a tyrannical God in the skies. God is always right in what he does. Charles Darwin resented the way the God that he interpreted as being in the universe, if there is such a God, he said, would behave himself. In turn, here is the great genius of Charles Darwin. He was the first man in all history to express the fact that he felt the entire universe had finally evolved to the point where it was a self-realizing universe that produced the brain of Charles Darwin that could conceive of the fact that the universe evolved to the point of self-realization, and the human brain expressed that. Let me say that in other words. Charles Darwin was the first man whose brain realized that he was the ultimate expression of a writhing, contorting, chaotic universe realizing itself in expression. His chaos, his phobias were identified with what he saw throughout nature. Are you still with me? You understand what I've just said? Did you know that you have that thought process? And if you don't find the real answer to it, and the real answer is in the person of God's Son and then the God of the Bible, if you don't find the answer to it, 
you could find yourself teaching evolution and believing it because there is a lot of writhing, contorting chaos in the world. But it's not the result of God's failure. I hope to answer those questions later. The evolutionary concept is naturalism that would take life forms and develop them progressively over long periods of time until finally that life form could realize the process by which it all occurred as a universal law, universal concept of chaos and disorder, and the chaos and disorder within the mind and phobic disposition of man would then be simply a natural concept of the chaos, death, and destruction throughout all these life processes. Well, is that falsifiable? For anything to be scientific, it must be falsifiable. The evolutionary concept is falsifiable. Charles Darwin himself said, I shudder at seeing the human eye. It's so complicated. And he wrote in Origins, if it can be shown that there are life forms which are so complicated they cannot be explained by natural processes from preceding life, then my whole theory will fall to ruins. He's right. Recently, The Blind Watchmaker was printed, published in London and New York, by a world-leading academic scholar. Dr. Hawkins, the author of that Blind Watchmaker, admitted that if we can find academic evidence of existence of man down here, or very complicated forms such as horses down here, then that totally falsifies the entire concept. We're going to do better than that. Before this day is out, I'm going to show you actual tangible evidence of occupation of superior man down here who had technology superior to the best of our technology today. And in between, we'll do a lot of other things. This process is thus falsifiable. In fact, at Glen Rose, we have found trilobites, some of the early life forms, in the same stone with two major dinosaurs, with seven cat prints, with 57 human footprints, and 192 dinosaur footprints. There are persons in this audience today who have helped us, who have actually removed the overburden, have delicately excavated under the auspices of the museum, through the clay marl, and have actually uncovered original dinosaur footprints adjacent to trails of human footprints. Is there anyone in this audience who has so participated in such an excavation? Would you raise your hands if you would like to admit that? Wonderful. Wonderful. Scott, is what I just said true? And you're shaking your head yes. For the sake of the cameras, for the sake of those listening by audio, would you answer verbally, is it true? And you would stake your academic reputation on that, right? I'm staking mine as well. In other words, the excavations at Glenrose totally destroy the evolutionary concept and the evolutionary model. And we're in the process of declaring that in dissertation and in the process of introducing that to the public school system. May I recommend for those viewing by video and audio, listening by audio, that the Texas Textbook Committee has done a wonderful job. They have come up with a concept that is academic, that is in response to the um, mandate of the U.S. Supreme Court, June 19, 1987, in that alternate academic concepts, as long as they are presented with a secular purpose, can be introduced at the discretion of the teacher into the public school system. So the Texas Textbook Committee has come up with a novel idea consistent with the Constitution of the United States, and it is as follows. Any time any concept of life origins is taught simultaneously, any evidence supporting that Supplementing that or refuting that must also be taught. Now that does not introduce religious, biblical creationism into the public school system, but that's fine because academically we have so much evidence that should show and does show special divine creation 
that there is no problem whatsoever in introducing it as academic evidence, but that's exactly what it is. And I hope to give you much of that academic evidence today. The evolutionary model is not only a concept taught in secular naturalistic thought process, but the evolutionary concept is a thought process that you have expressed to yourself. It is common to the human experience. But now, let's take an overview of the alternate concept. There are numerous theories about evolution. There is not a single theory that satisfies all scholars. And admittedly, there is not a single theory of evolution that holds up under academic scrutiny. One reason the academician does not want scientific creationism taught is admittedly, as some scholars have stated, the model for special creation is far superior to the model of evolution. The theories of evolution are various. Some of them include uh, theistic evolution. May I say a quick word about theistic evolution? That is poor science and poor theology. To blame God for doing it that way is a real problem. Because if this is true, the scientific facts do not stack up. For instance, you have a population problem, a real population problem. There's a science of population statistics which is very refined, which shows that today we are increasing 2% a year in population. But let's be very conservative. Let's take that back to half, 1% a year throughout history, and it is shown that due to various problems of plagues, wars, pestilence, disease, about every 82 years, historically, half of the population of the world has been wiped out, either by the wars or by pestilence or plagues. Let's take that into account. If the creation model that I'm going to introduce an overview in just a moment is correct, then it must match up in all scientific disciplines. It does. I hope to introduce a number of those to you today. Watch the following. Increasing at the rate of 1% a year and every 82 years wiping out one half of the population of the world, using that as the formula and going back to 4,300 years ago, which a tight chronology of Noah's flood, the record of Noah's flood in biblical language and in academic research would give us, going back 4,300 years ago, starting with four families, and in the biblical record, that's where we start, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Starting with four families, going back 4,300 years, using this as a formula, which is consistent with data and scientific population growth, how many people would we have alive on the planet Earth today? 4.5 billion by conservative standards. How many people are alive today on planet Earth? Just under 5 billion people. That is very consistent. Some have suggested that we might have 5.2 billion people, but nobody's counting specifically. That has to be estimated. But this is totally consistent. If we use the 1%, because we're using conservative figures, if we use a uh, percentage above that, we get to 5 or 5.2 billion people on the face of the globe. But now to the evolutionary concept, it must address a major problem. And the problem is as follows. Using that same concept, according to the theory of evolution, the first family of man was actually introduced to planet Earth a little over two million years ago. All right, let's increase. 1% a year, wipe out half the population every 82 years, use the very same formula. We have a major problem. Just going back 41,000 years ago, which is just a drop in the bucket by evolutionary scale of time value. 41,000 years ago, at that rate, 
you know how many people would be alive using the very same formula? Hope we have mathematicians. Scott, help me a little bit here. We would have 2 times 10 to the 89th power of people. Is that a little problem? If the universe is 16 billion light years old, as the most avid evolutionary scholars suggest very vehemently, and if the universe continues to expand, and it does not, according to latest astrophysical data, but give them all of those things, if the universe continues to expand, there is not enough space in the entire universe to put that many people. For the universe only holds, according to the best calculated hypothesis, 10 to the 81st power electrons. The whole universe only holds 10 to the 81st power of electrons. But by simple statistical analysis of the population, we would have 2 times 10 to the 89th power of people alive if that simple conservative formula were used just back 41,000 years ago. I'm saying let's approach this thing academically, intelligently. Now, there are other problems. Now, there are other problems with this evolutionary model. The problems are, uh, in simplistic terms, there are many, many problems, but one problem is that we find man appearing in sophisticated form, not primitive form. Did you know that your parents are superior to you? They were superior enough to produce you, weren't they? <laughs> Academically, it can be proved that they are superior to you. They may not have the same educational value and opportunity that you have, but they are superior. We are decreasing in intelligence and in intellectual capacity. We might be increasing in our ability to use what we have because we have greater opportunity, but our intellectual capacity is diminished. In the concept of evolving man, if the Australopithecines were spawning life forms 11 million years ago that ultimately became man, um, that would use up all the monkeys. But they're still in existence. Why didn't they evolve? The same concept shows that the crocodiles and alligators would all be used up. Did you know that some life forms that are supposedly 450 million years old are unchanged throughout the fossil record? Why have they not changed if evolution is true? It's another major problem. If naturalistic evolution is true, the dinosaurs could not have existed. They have a major problem, and that introduces us to the creation concept. Let's be introduced to creation by the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs are intriguing creatures. My wife lives with one. <laughs> or he behaves like that sometime. The dinosaurs are very intriguing. They range from the flying pterosaurs, who were exotic type creatures. One was found in West Texas with a 52 foot wingspan. The dinosaurs range from the flying pterosaurs to um, pterosaurs that could fly and walk, like Rampharynchus, we found evidence of his existence at least in footprint uh, fossils in Glen Rose. They range from those to the walking dinosaurs, some of them the size of uh, a small bird, some of them Tyrannosaurus rex size, some of them much larger than that. In fact, the largest specimen suggested so far is Seismosaurus. Seismosaurus looked much like that fellow, that's Apatosaurus, except that Seismosaurus could raise his head almost 70 feet in the air was 140 feet long from snout to tail and weighed almost 200,000 pounds. That's a pretty good sized Texas lizard, wouldn't you say? <laughs> and it wasn't even found in Texas. It was found in New Mexico, of all places. 
you know, Texas lizards are very agile. They can travel to New Mexico. <laughs> but he had a major problem. Evolutionary concept cannot explain how the dinosaurs could live and proliferate for the following reason. He had a small lung capacity. So did T. rex. Tyrannosaurus rex was a fierce guy according to the evolutionary concept, yet according to our investigation, he was as tame as uh, a backyard kitten. The dinosaurs actually are a vital part of the creation model. Dinosaurs have been used to accentuate the evolutionary concept because they represent the macabre, uh, the death-like, the intriguing, destructive forces, brute forces of the past that would eat anything they could uh, catch. Did you ever look at the tooth of Tyrannosaurus rex up close? Probably not, did you? His teeth are like this. We have one from the Smithsonian. His teeth are almost seven inches long. And I want to show you something about the tooth of Tyrannosaurus rex. First, it's serrated on both sides. Saw edges. You don't need saws for cutting meat. It is interpreted by evolutionary concept that uh, he would eat anything he could catch. Well, not so. You don't need saws for cutting meat. You need saws for cutting canes and grasses. Plus, his roots were less than two inches deep, which means if he were to attack the hide of another dinosaur, he'd pull his own teeth out. Problem for Tyrannosaurus rex. And then, guess what they found embedded in his teeth? Chlorophyll. Let's draw that green, not black. They found chlorophyll embedded in his teeth. Where do you get chlorophyll? From green plants. You certainly don't get them from the hides of other dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus rex actually is found in Job, chapter 40, verses 15 through 24. He's called behemoth in the biblical record, and he is a part of the answer. I'll give you an overview of the creation model. What was the world like before the flood? The world before the flood needed Tyrannosaurus rex, Apatosaurus, Seismosaurus, and all their cousins. The world before the flood is the only plausible academic explanation for the existence of the pterosaurs, the flying dinosaurs. They could not fly in this atmosphere. In case there are engineers in this audience, you know that there is a specific formula for buoyancy, which accounts for density in the atmosphere, and or which takes density into account in the formula, and unless the density is appropriate, a certain craft can't fly. That's the reason it's much easier for a Boeing 747 jet to take off from uh, Houston at sea level than it is at Denver because there's not enough atmospheric pressure or density at Denver to support the weight factor in the formula for lift. Well, the same principle holds for the pterosaurs. What was the world like before the flood? In brief, the world before the flood was a paradise except for one very violent creature, only one. The atmosphere was not violent. In the next session, you'll be introduced to that atmosphere at great length. Uh, the animals were no problem. Vegetation was no problem. Chemistry behaved as it should. There was only one violent life form to take the peace away from the pre-flood context. I wonder, is there anyone here that represents the offspring of that life form <laughs> and would admit it? along with me. That's right. We're the problem, aren't we? The world before the flood can be represented, and the creation model can be represented like this. We have a pristine world of beauty with a great sea, a great ocean, and seas fingering into the landmass. And that world was surrounded by a firmament canopy. That canopy of water 
was approximately 11 miles above the Earth. In the next lecture, I'll show you reasons why we know it was approximately 11 miles above the Earth. This is not drawn to scale. Now, that firmament canopy of water did a wonderful thing. It filtered out the shortwave radiation from the sun and from stellar bodies. But the long wave and mid-spectral radiation would come right on in. That did something wonderful. The world before the flood had greater atmospheric pressure because of the gravitational weight of that firmament pushing in on the atmosphere. The world before the flood was protected from the harmful radiation. And that produced some very wonderful things. In our excavations <coughs> at Glen Rose, we have found human footprints among dinosaur prints. We've excavated 57 human footprints. I'll give you a, an actual sample illustrating that in the Burdick print at the close of this lecture series. We've excavated five footprints, four footprints that were five inches long. There were kids around, you know. Had to be kids around to have adults around sooner or later. Four footprints, five inches long. We've excavated nine footprints that are nine and three quarter inches long. We've excavated seven footprints that are 11 and a half inches long. Original excavations. We've excavated seven footprints that are 14 inches long, like the Burdick print, and they're feminine. <laughs> Later, I'll show you why we know they're feminine academically. We've excavated 37 footprints that are 16 inches long, and then we excavated five big ones, 22 inches long. Now, in case you're adding, we're using the, five, the four footprints in the river, not among the 57 that we claim, because that was not our original excavation. All total, we've excavated 57. The big ones were 22 inches long. They were masculine, however. Aren't you glad? <laughs> the 16-inch prints were masculine as well. And that matches very nicely. If a fellow has a 16-inch foot, he would look for a girl with a 14-inch foot. Or if a girl has a 14-inch foot, she looks for a fellow with a 16-inch foot. It, it works out quite well that way. But there were giants in the earth. In fact, all of the life forms were gigantic. Watch this. Essentially, everything in the fossil record was larger in the past than it is today. Uh, the great white shark today gets 36 feet long. But in the fossil record, he is 60 feet long. Something must explain that. Don't leave the seminar, you'll find the answer to that. In addition to that, this uh, Lipidodendron has its counterpart today. The very same form is the Lycopsid club moss. It gets 16 inches tall at best. But in the fossil record, that very same plant is 150 feet tall. We're not evolving. We've lost something in the process or lost the conditions that would permit the full expression of the life form. Did you get that? We are building a context at Glen Rose for the first time in history called the hyperbaric biosphere. And in that biosphere, we're going to be having 2.18 atmospheres of pressure. That's what the best of our research shows that canopy firmament pushing in on the atmosphere would have introduced 2.18 atmospheres of pressure. We're going to introduce 25% oxygen, 0.25% CO2, carbon dioxide. That should make a world of difference because that's what academically we find indicated in the fossil record. What will that do? Well, we have um, dragonflies today. Here in East Texas, the dragonflies get how big? About a four inch wingspan, maybe five inches. In the fossil record, that very same life form, the dragonfly, had a 36 inch wingspan. 
What explains that? The evolutionary concept cannot really explain that because if the processes with increased energy, which I'll address in the next lecture, with increased complexity is causing the forms to accelerate in complexity, they certainly should accelerate in dexterity and size. Well, that's not the case. We find they were bigger in the past. Human life forms were larger in the past, and incidentally, they were more intelligent in the past. So intelligent, as a rule, they didn't need to take notes for a lecture like this. <laughs> How many have been taking notes? I think that's every hand in the building. That shows how intelligent you are because you realize how incapable you are. Did you follow? You realize your limitations. But given these circumstances, with a little over two atmospheres of pressure, 25% oxygen in contrast to today's 21% oxygen, the brain from conception on would be hyper-oxygenated, not to the point of toxicity. This is the perfect level, a little over two atmospheres of pressure, 25% oxygen. In the fetal formation of the brain, it would be enlarged to begin with. The cellular structure would be fed and nurtured from before the child was born. Then you would live in a context where your brain would be totally fed in all its capacity with oxygen. That means that every person sitting in this audience, if you were to live under these conditions and having been born under those conditions, would put Albert Einstein to shame in your intellectual capacity. You have that capacity. Why don't you use it? Well, we really can't to our fullest capacity. But if our brains, if the blood plasma were hyper-oxygenated today, that would solve a lot of problems. Oh, that does solve a lot of problems, including the dinosaurs. You see, with their small lung capacity, by the time they reach puberty, before they could uh, repopulate, they would itch to death from the outside in under evolutionary concept. Wouldn't that be terrible? You wouldn't want that to happen to the dinosaurs because there's such bulk, weight, and size that with their small lung capacity, the hemoglobin cell can only take four oxygen molecules. Did you know that? The hemoglobin in the blood is saturated with four oxygen molecules. That's all it can take. And you can't get enough oxygen to the deep cell tissue of such bulk size. But Texas A&M University has found that under two atmospheres of pressure with slightly enriched oxygen, all the blood plasma becomes saturated with oxygen. That means that overnight, an open wound heals. Today, it takes 14 days for that open wound to heal. But overnight, under those hyper-oxygenated contexts, an open wound heals. I saw a miracle. I was in the hyperbaric medical chamber at Texas A&M. I was in with my wife, who's a patient there. I was in with a young man who's a paraplegic, and then the director of the program. I had arranged for the young paraplegic to be there. He had uh, real problems. Uh, his right hand was drawn up. His right foot was uh, essentially lame. And <coughs> he's a very fine friend, has made uh, contributions to the work. And I arranged for him to take one of the treatments. During his fifth treatment, under two atmospheres of pressure with enriched oxygen, now he was breathing 100% oxygen for short range time. You can't do that permanently. But under, the, um, under those conditions, I was there during his fifth treatment. His hand was like that. He looked over at me and he said, I think I can do it. Now he had a helmet over his head, plastic helmet, breathing 100% oxygen. He was under two atmospheres of pressure. Under those contexts, his blood plasma became saturated with oxygen and fed to the brain and the rest of the body oxygen he was not getting under one atmosphere. Do you understand? What he was doing was actually exercising 
under a context very similar to the pre-flood atmosphere, if not identical. There he was. About halfway through the treatment, he looked at me and said, I think I can do it. I said, what are you going to do? He said, it feels like I can do it. And he began to move his fingers. And then he straightened out his hand. He straightened out his arm, reached out and shook hands with me. I said, have you ever done that before? He said, not since the accident five and a half years ago. Well, next week he called me from his office and I said, uh, how are you doing? He said, great. I said, how does your hand feel? He said, right now I'm massaging a ball with it. He said, I'm using it to write. Is that miraculous? Sure. Well, what's the answer? Why did he behave like that? He continues to exercise it and continues to use his hand. And his speech is a lot better, incidentally. How is that possible? It appears academically that his body was designed to function best under two atmospheres of pressure with enriched oxygen, like we had before the flood. Same thing would be true of the dinosaurs. They couldn't make it in today's atmosphere. They would itch to death sitting on a freeway if the semi didn't get them before they just died from oxygen starvation. I'd rather the semi get them because that's a quick death uh, rather than itch to death. That's a horrible death. Don't you agree? Well, they just couldn't make it today. But under two atmospheres of pressure, they would have a field day. Their bodies would be, their blood plasma would be saturated with oxygen. They could uh, grow to be as big as they could live long enough to be, and they continue to grow as long as they live. Now, let me illustrate it another way. The creation model has some wonderful facets that match academic study. If you had an accident in the pre-flood world, it shouldn't really be a problem unless someone knocked your head completely off. <laughs> I don't recommend that. National Geographic was running some experiments some time ago in a diving bell and some men were uh, on a dive, in a diving bell on the floor of the ocean. They averaged around two atmospheres of pressure and averaged about 25% oxygen. There were times they went up to a much greater percentage, but they bled that out because you can't live under 100% oxygen. First place, you can't cook breakfast under 100% oxygen. You'll explode the entire experiment. Second place, you get toxicity. That's too much oxygen. Your body gets poisoned with toxicity. But uh, they averaged around 25% oxygen, a little over two atmospheres of pressure. Under those circumstances, one of the men had an accident. On one of the instruments, he cut his hand wide open. He radioed up to the directors and said, I've got a problem. There's no doctor around. My hand's cut wide open. What shall I do? They said, we'll terminate the program and come at you. He said, well, surprisingly, it doesn't hurt. And he said, um, I think I can hold out for a day, and we'll run some more experiments, and then you can come after me. They agreed. A day passed. He radioed back to them and said, you don't need to come after me. My hand has healed itself. Overnight. It takes 14 days for that to happen today even with medication. So it was a wonder world before the flood. I'm just giving you an overview of what it was like. Now let's take it further. I think probably the best illustration of what it was like before the flood or what it was like to recuperate before the flood is found uh, in the experience of a little girl, probably the most famous little girl in the world. Does anyone here recognize the name Jessica McClure? How many recognize the name Jessica McClure? Every hand in the building, as far as I can see. Who's that little girl? She's a little girl who fell in a well in Midland, Texas. Fifty-eight and a half hours, her right leg was suspended behind her back. And for fifty-eight and a half hours, her right foot was in her face. That's a pretty difficult position to be in. She's a brave little girl. I'm not sure I could have held out that long. When they got to her, her right foot, because of its suspension and the lack of blood supply and oxygen, her right foot was black, and they were sure they were going to have to amputate her foot. You know what they did for that little girl? 
They rushed her to the Midland Hospital, rushed her to a hyperbaric medical chamber. They put her under two plus atmospheres of pressure and they gave her 100% oxygen because they needed a quick fix. <laughs> now she couldn't live under 100% oxygen for long periods of time, but you, they certainly needed it quickly. So they essentially put her in a context like pre-flood man had. What happened to her right foot? In a few hours, it turned pink. And then her toes began to turn pink. They thought at first they'd lose the entire foot. Then they thought, well, we're not gonna lose the foot, we'll lose all her toes. Then her big toe turned pink. Second, third, fourth, they finally lost the little pinky because it wouldn't turn pink. Well, what I'm doing is introducing an overview of the creation model. It appears that her body was designed to function and repair itself under those circumstances. Well, if that's so, her body had to be designed. And if that's so, her long lost predecessors lived under such a context. Well, that's the creation model. With a firmament canopy of water suspended above the earth in the next lectures on energy, you will learn how it was suspended above the earth. And <coughs> the furnace was in the floor, but not only would that have tremendous effects physiologically for animals, it would have tremendous effects for vegetation. And that effect would be as follows. It has been found that if you increase carbon dioxide and increase pressure, the plants grow tremendously. In fact, it has been found by experimentation of a Japanese physicist, Dr. Kimori, Kyo University, Tokyo, Japan, who had a problem. Dr. Kimori lived in his house, but his office was in the basement. There's Dr. Mori behind his desk. You'd recognize him anywhere, wouldn't you? Hope the cameras get a close-up. That's Dr. Mori, believe it or not. But he has a problem. He doesn't have enough light in his basement, and he doesn't want to pay for any more electricity. That's always a problem. But Dr. Mori had an ingenious idea. He knew what fiber optics would do, and he had some fiber optic cable at the university. So he brought some home, with or without permission, I don't know. He brought some home, and he ran it out the roof ran it through the rafters, down the walls, and into the basement, and sure enough, it worked. You know how fiber optic cables work. You can tie them in a knot, shine a light in one end, and the light will just follow all the way through the knot and come out the other end. Well, that's what happened here. So it worked. Light from the sun struck the cable, came right on down, and came out the bottom into his basement. Beautiful. What he forgot was that the dimension of the fiber optic cable that he had filtered out the ultraviolet spectrum of light. Now that's important. It's the ultraviolet that's giving us most of the trouble we have today. In the next lecture, you'll see how it's destroying us. It's the ultraviolet that is a major problem. All right, that fiber optic cable filtered out the ultraviolet so that the light he got in his basement was essentially like the light we got before the flood because water also filters out ultraviolet and shortwave radiation. Did you get that? The light that he got was like the light we had before the flood. So, Dr. Mori, being Japanese, wanted to plant something living. And he put a little tomato plant, just a natural tomato plant in his basement. In a few weeks, the thing grew out of control. He knew he had something. So he went outside, built a platform, shielded that platform from ultraviolet radiation with <coughs> a shielding process, plastic shielding process, put his tomato plant there, but he did something else. He knew that tomato plant, if it was going to grow that fast, needed a lot more carbon dioxide. Indications are in the fossil record that we had a lot more carbon dioxide than we had in the past. So he increased the carbon dioxide and pressure at the base of his plant. Guess what happened to his plant, his tomato plant? It grew. <laughs> How well did it grow? Now remember, 
What he's doing is actually simulating primitively what it was like before the flood. So, what happened to his tomato plant? After two years, two years? How long do your tomato plants live here in East Texas? Five months if you're lucky, right? I mean, very fortunate. You say it's the frost that gets them. No, it's old age that gets them. The frost might get them before they get too old, but they're being destroyed by ultraviolet radiation. You say, but there are some special uh, lamps where you can grow things quicker. Yes, you can shock them into growth quicker with ultraviolet radiation, but you also kill them sooner. And that's not what we're looking for, is it? We don't want to be seven feet tall when we're six years old and then die when we're nine, do we? <laughs> that's not what we're looking for. Look what happened. After two years, his tomato plant was 16 feet tall, 903 tomatoes on it. But that's not the end of the story. His tomato plant doesn't want to die. It's still living. That was six years ago when he planted the thing. It is now over 30 feet tall, has over 5,000 tomatoes on it. And it's still living. Well, now, compared to your five-month tomato plants, and that six-year-old tomato plant, let's do a little math. That's a 12-fold lifespan already, isn't it? What about those ages in the biblical record? Are they literal? Well, let's see if it'll do that for tomato plants. It ought to do that for us under those circumstances, shouldn't it? Um, how old do you think would be a good age to live and still be in, uh, in control and in command of your faculties? 80? Multiply 80 by 12. What do you get? 960. That has a 12-fold lifespan. Multiply your 80 by 12 and you get 960 years. That means that in certainly academic theory, the capability under those circumstances is for some of your ancestors to have lived 960 years. Did they? Sure they did. Methuselah lived older than that. Adam almost lived that long. But now it's better still. Let me wind up this introductory concept. This is just an overview. We've only introduced the concept. One of the nation's leading scholars is Dr. Edward Blick, University of Oklahoma head of aerospace engineering department. Dr. Edward Blick has stated in print that under these circumstances, with the firmament canopy filtering out the ultraviolet radiation, and under these circumstances, with the added pressure introduced by the gravitational weight of that firmament pushing in on the atmosphere, under those circumstances, with man's large lung capacity, man could run up to 200 miles without fatigue. How many would like to be able to run 200 miles without fatigue? Sure. How many would like to be able to run 200 miles? Well, how many would like to be able to run at all? Under those circumstances, it was absolutely utopian. But if only touched the hem of the garment, it's much better still. Stay tuned. After a short break, we'll come back to the next lecture. A model is extremely important. A philosophic or academic model is a systematic outline of the entire concept, but that model must address all pertinent questions relative to its central nature. For instance, this is the accepted model of evolutionary development. It's called the paradigm. That means the systematic uh, outline. That paradigm is actually the Bible of the evolutionist. And the evolutionist defends these concepts, particular ages at particular times in the distant, uh, intermediate, and near past. This is defended as rigorously as you defend the Bible. Models are very, very important. 
And this particular model breaks down, admittedly, if we can verify that there's evidence for man here, or evidence for man here, or evidence for man here, or for that matter, if there's evidence for these life forms up here without any uh, continuation of their being in this early section of the Cenozoic period, the whole thing breaks down. Or if there's academic information which shows that it's not possible for these life forms to have evolved for one reason or another, this whole thing breaks down. Models are extremely important. The um, central concept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is central to an entire model. It's not simply a person appearing on the scene saying, I'm God the Son. That statement that Jesus Christ made before Abraham was, I am, is consistent with the entire model of the biblical record. From creation, through the advanced prophecies of the Old Testament, through the miraculous nature of his life, and the prophetic statements that he made about his own resurrection and about future events. It is all one consistent model, and all the details must be addressed in that model. All principles must be addressed, or the model falls down. I'm satisfied academically, religiously, and personally that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he did arise from the dead, and the prophecies that he made about this very day in which we live within the next two hours will hopefully make more sense to you. For instance, Jesus talked about people behaving in bizarre fashion. I think we're living in that day. He was disposed to state to us that there would be a time when it would be very difficult to find faith on the earth. When we actually examine our motivation for our own service, we have to question the fact that we even have faith. And in case you're questioning that, the answer is available in the nail-scarred hands of the Son of God, incidentally. For those viewing the tape, Jesus Christ is available here and now, and he offers himself. Now, having said that, that the evolutionary concept requires a model, the statement that dinosaurs evolved would require a model to support it, a statement that Jesus Christ is the inter intervention of God in human history requires a model to support it, and the model is there from Genesis 1-1 all the way through Revelation 22-21 and is verified in experience, personal experience. Now, the creation model is totally consistent with the biblical record However, it goes beyond that. It stands on its own as an academic model independent of the biblical record. In case there are public educators here today, that's an extremely important statement. June 19, 1987, the Supreme Court of the United States struck down the Equal Treatment or Balanced Act, Balanced Treatment Act from Louisiana public school system. But in striking that down, stating that it was required that there be scientific creationism taught alongside secular humanism, or the evolutionary model, the Supreme Court did uphold the fact <clears throat> that the public school teacher has the right, at his or her discretion, to teach any theory of life origins, or life development, or life order, or any scientific concept of life order, as long as it's done with a secular purpose in mind, not to inhibit or enhance any religious body. And that's all right. For instance, I wouldn't want an evolutionist teaching biblical creation in the public school system. Can you imagine an evolutionist stating, I don't believe this, but I'm going to tell you the story about two naked people in a garden with a snake. And that's the way they would approach the thing. And that's not what we find in the biblical record. We find them clothed with glory and grace, incidentally, until they listen to the snake, and then they had problems. And if you listen to the snake, you'll have problems consequently as well. What I'm trying to show you today is 
what the Supreme Court upheld. In that final decision, June 19th, 1987, they upheld the Fifth Appellate Court decision which said that a theory or concept of life, origins of life order, such as creationism, may be taught in the public school system even if it coincidentally is in agreement with religious convictions. Everyone is religious. There's nothing wrong with teaching something that parallels your religious convictions as long as it's taught in the public school system with a secular intent in mind. Secular intent means with no design to inhibit or enhance any religious concept. Do you understand what I'm talking about? With that in mind, I want you to critique the whole creation model. I call it the orchestral model. I mentioned previously that at the Creation Evidences Museum, we have over 50 scientists and engineers in background on a consultant basis. We don't pay them a cent. They come or they lend or they write. They contribute academic information that they have researched or that which has been researched for them. I claim no originality to anything that I have. If I have a good thought and I don't know where it came from, it's because I forgot where it came from. <laughs> Nothing with me that is good is original. Did I make that point very clear? <laughs> All right. Hopefully you will have the same attitude because if we have struck on the right answer, and I think we have, we don't deserve the credit. We didn't create ourselves. We're not a self-realizing universe that finally, as Darwin suggested, came to self-realization with his own mind. Therefore, he was God. That's the bottom line of what Darwin was saying, and that's the bottom line of what the academic evolutionist today is saying. We essentially are God. We're the universe self-realizing itself. Okay, this, I want you to critique this, and I think in the previous lecture you found that there is academic evidence to show that we had to be designed purposefully because of the amount of informational bits available and orchestrated within every tiny cell and every living organism. At the same time, I believe you understood that this model addresses all of the basic cosmological questions. In, uh, from the standpoint of astronomy, it addresses how the stars could be at a distance and yet could have the light shining at the appropriate placement. It addresses a recent moon origin. It addresses the instantaneous creation, designed, orchestrated, purposeful creation of the granite crust which is the eggshell of the earth. It addresses that. Now, let's go further. This creation model addresses a problem that evolutionists have ignored. And that is the dinosaurs, which represent the ultimate emblem of evolutionary thought. The dinosaurs could not have existed under the evolutionary atmosphere. For them to exist at all with their small lung capacity, there had to be something pressing in on the atmosphere. For them to exist at all in uh, terrestrial life forms, the flying reptiles, there had to be greater atmospheric pressure. That's exactly what we find mandated in the creation model, and that's exactly what we find in the biblical record. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 6, a statement is made, an extremely important statement is made, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let's explore that from the academic viewpoint. I think we've established the fact that there was something pressing in on the atmosphere at the time the fossil record was laid down. I think we've established that the fact that the dinosaurs existed mandates that there was something pressing in on the atmosphere. Whatever was pressing in on the atmosphere had to be compatible with that atmosphere. In the biblical record, it shows clearly that that firmament canopy pressing in on the atmosphere was made of the elements of water. What are the elements of water? Hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. That's clear from the biblical record. Let's examine that academically. 
We know there was something pressing in. What could it have been? It had to be something favorable to the atmosphere because these life forms all have either their exact duplicates or relative duplicates in the modern world. All of these, from the mammoths all the way to some of these crustaceans down here, all of them have either exact replication in the modern world, in the modern atmosphere, or similar replications in the atmosphere. And we have the ability to vary, by the way. That's called macroevolution. Macroevolution, I don't even, I don't like the term, but academically it's correct. Macroevolution means variation within genetic boundaries. No problem with macroevolution, even though if you say, I believe in macroevolution, you say, wait a minute, you believe in evolution. No, the evolutionary concept as such uh, is not plausible, is not scientifically feasible at all, and is certainly not biblically feasible. Macroevolution simply means variation within genetic bounds. I vary about 15 pounds a month. <laughs> uh, but I'm still human, and I'm not going to evolve into something else. That's macroevolution. I hope it stays macro. It's already varied a lot, and I'd like to, like to eliminate that variation altogether. That is, I'd like to be in the form I was when I was 20, and have the experience I have at 53. Wouldn't that be a nice world in which to live? I wouldn't trade this experience for my youth, by the way. I've learned how to stay out of trouble a little bit. Okay, let's talk about that firmament context. It would have some wonderful repercussions in the ecology of the world. We don't have it in existence today. Having established that there are life forms there, that are similar or identical to the modern life forms, that means that whatever made that thing would have to be, or whatever it was made of, would have to be compatible with our current atmosphere. Okay, what do we have in our current atmosphere, the gases of the atmosphere? Help me out. Nitrogen, about 78%. What else? Oxygen, about 21%. What else? Carbon dioxide, uh, 0 0.03. Percent. Then we have uh, trace elements. What else do we have in the atmosphere? Argon, trace elements. Helium, ozone, trace elements. We're glad they're in trace elements. We have one other very important assimilation. What's that? Hydrogen? No, hydrogen is bound up. Fortunately, it's bound up because it's volatile. It's bound in the water molecule. But, and well, we've already said nitrogen. We have water vapor in the atmosphere. Okay, let's see what a candidate we would have. Now, remember the biblical record started by saying this was made of water on day number two. Um, let's see what we can make it of. Let's try to make it out of nitrogen. You can make it out of anything that'll work. Anything that'll work. You can make it out of a vault if you want to. It has to press in on the atmosphere to generate a little over two atmospheres of pressure, and it has to filter out the ultraviolet, because remember the Dr. Kimori tomato plant? He filtered the ultraviolet, and he got those results right there. So it has to do all of that, and water filters the ultraviolet. Okay, let's try to make it out of something other than water. Let's make it out of nitrogen, okay? That much nitrogen pressing in on the atmosphere and in contact with the atmosphere would assimilate into the atmosphere and thus assimilate out, assimilate out so much oxygen that we'd be in major trouble. Can't make it out of nitrogen, we'd bleed out all the oxygen, or so much of the oxygen, we just couldn't make it. Nitrogen won't work. Okay, let's make it out of oxygen. Hmm. What would happen with that much oxygen pressing in on the atmosphere, assimilating into the atmosphere? That would give so much oxygen content that the entire atmosphere would be volatile. You'd burst into flames. So that won't work. And if you didn't do that, you'd get oxygen toxicity. So oxygen won't work. It's in the atmosphere, but you can't make a canopy out of it with enough weight pressing in <coughs> on the atmosphere. What else? Let's make it out of carbon dioxide won't work. You get too much carbon dioxide, 
and you put everything to sleep with a headache, in less than five minutes, you'll put it to sleep permanently. That is, you'll put all the animals to sleep permanently with a headache in less than five minutes with too much carbon dioxide, with that much carbon dioxide. What else do we have? Take the trace elements. All the trace elements are lethal. Argon, <coughs> all of them in greater form would be lethal. What do we have left? Water. Simply, water. Will water work? Sure, that's compatible with the atmosphere. There's plenty of it around, particularly with last night's storms. <coughs> Let's make it out of water, just like the biblical record said to begin with. Making it out of water would do a number of things. First, it would filter the shortwave radiation, because water absorbs shortwave radiation, and the mid-spectral and long-wave radiation would come right on in, and that's necessary for photosynthesis. It would add to the pressure, and that's necessary, and plants would grow, as we have indicated in the fossil record. How big are plants in the fossil record? They're extremely large. How big could tomato plants grow under those circumstances? Or at least 30 feet tall, we know by experimentation. What about uh, club mosses that get that tall today? Like Hopsett club moss, 150 feet in the fossil record. What about cattails? Cattails today grow here in East Texas to be about six or seven feet tall. You know what cattails are. But in the fossil record, that same plant is 60 feet tall with a 10-foot cone. Something has to explain that. No problem with the creation model. It all matches. And incidentally, that brings the dinosaurs onto the scene. In Job chapter 40, verses 15 through 24, it describes the dinosaurs as behemoth, and it states that they eat grass like an ox. An ox is bovine. It's like the cattle in the fields. How long do the cows in the field eat grass? All day and all night. And when they lie down, they're chewing the grass. So the dinosaurs had an insatiable appetite for mature vegetation. And incidentally, the dinosaurs were also scavengers. Scavengers balance out nature. Some of the dinosaurs were scavengers. Scavengers are really the best friends we have in the animal kingdom. At the museum, we're adjacent to uh, Park Road 59 and FM 205 in Somerville County. We have a lot of skunks that are killed on the road. I praise the Lord for buzzards, <laughs> the scavengers, because if it weren't for the buzzards, guess who would have to clean the skunks up? <laughs> the director of the museum would have to clean the skunks up. But all I have to do is dodge them, because in a few hours they will be gone because of the scavengers. And since there are accidents in nature, and since death and restoration in the biological world since the fall are calculated in, we needed the scavengers. Incidentally, if evolution were true, we would be piled high with bones of man's predecessors. There wouldn't be any difficulty if we had if evolution were true, as we learned in the first lecture, the population after just 41,000 years would be 2 times 10 to the 89th power. Right, Scott? Pretty big number, right? We'd have bones. You say, oh, well, once the earth were populated, we'd wipe them off. Yeah, but there'd be a few bones of them around somewhere. So it all fits together that the evolutionary concept falls down when you examine it closely. But the creation model with only a few uh, thousand years of existence, fits perfectly. The vegetation required the dinosaurs. Well, how could that vegetation grow so, so big? We found from Dr. Kimori's experiment, you filter the ultraviolet, and you add pressure and carbon dioxide, and you'll get those large forms. But now, let's take it a step further. We've got a problem with that canopy. First, it was there, had to be there, for us to get those life forms. But if it's just made out of water vapor, 
ICR, Institute for Creation Research in San Diego, California, has computers now large enough to put this thing in model, and you make that thing out of water vapor, or just water, and it won't stay up. It keeps collapsing into vortices. Have a real problem. You can't keep it up. How was it kept up? Well, the biblical records solved the problem all along. I want to wake you up this afternoon. The most difficult hour is the one immediately after lunch. Let me wake you up with something very startling. The biblical record had the answer all along. The word for firmament in Genesis 1, 6. You'll find all of this in Panorama of Creation. The word for firmament is rakia. Rakia means to compress, pound together, and stretch out this arch of heaven in thin metal sheets. Problem. <laughs> metal sheets? Oh, it was composed of water, but metal sheets? Major problem. I didn't know the answer to it. Dr. Dan Cook of Redding, California called me. Dr. Cook is a splendid researcher and scientist. He had read about uh, our little museum in Omni magazine. He called and he said, Dr. Ball, in my years of research, and I've worked for major labs, he stated, and he has, he said, in my years of research, I have found what the metal was in that firmament. Metal? I chuckled on the phone and said, Dan, was there metal in the firmament canopy? He said, that's what the biblical record says. And I said, yes, but I've always interpreted that figuratively uh, because it couldn't have been metal. He said, well, that's the only way it'll work. Have to have some metal. Has to be special metal. And I said, well, now wait a minute. Man standing on the earth before the flood. It's man and woman standing on the earth before the flood, looking at the moon and the stars. I said, Dan, do you mean they were looking through metal to see the stars? He said, don't you know that uh, most metals in their pure state are transparent? I said, I didn't know that, but since then I've found that that is the case. He said, um, you can look through metal and see all of the stellar heavens, sometime even better than you can see now. I said, I didn't know that. He said, well, don't you know that when our men walked on the surface of the moon, their space helmets had a visor. And when they looked through the visor onto the surface of the moon, there was a thin layer of transparent gold on the visor. And they were looking through transparent gold. I said, I didn't know that. He said that gold protected them from cosmic radiation. And they could see the details on the surface of the moon perfectly clear. So I said, well, fine. Uh, so you can see through gold. I didn't know that. He said, you should have known that. <laughs> he said, haven't you read about a city where the streets are paved with transparent gold? He said, don't you read the Bible? <laughs> yeah, I said, whoops, you've got me. I said, Dan, this was all long distance, and he was calling. It was his nickel. <laughs> So I wanted to talk as long as he wanted to talk. I said, Dan, do you mean to say that before the flood, when man looked up at the moon and the stars, looking through that firmament canopy, he was looking through transparent gold? Dr. Cook said, I didn't say it was gold. I just said I knew what metal it was. I said, what metal was it? He said, I'll drive to Glen Rose and tell you. Bye. And he hung up. <laughs> How many want to leave the seminar right now? <laughs> How many want to stay for another three hours? <laughs> two hands remained up. But you want to stay for the answer to this anyway. It took him two months to get to Glen Rose. <laughs> but when he got there, we spent two weeks comparing notes, and he's a brilliant scholar. Here's uh, what he related. A friend of his, a physicist involved in the project, reported to him directly and since then it's been confirmed with a number of experiments at major universities. At Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, 
they did some major work on the hydrogen bomb. And when they were doing the work, they took the elements of water. Again, what are the elements in water? Hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. They took the elements of water and they compressed them under super cold circumstances. Now remember, the word rakia, describing that firmament canopy, means to compress, pound together, and stretch out the arch of heaven in thin metal sheets. So, they weren't trying to simulate that, they were just running experiments. And by the way, at 11 miles above the earth, it is super cold. There's a heat sink there. It averages 150 below zero. Nearer the earth, it's warmer. Further out, it's warmer, then it cools off to deep space. But at that zone, it's quite cold. And that's, the model doesn't depend on that, but that's just incidentally interesting. Now watch this. At that time, the electromagnetic field would have been much stronger. Every time we have sunspot activity affecting the electromagnetic field and strengthening it, one episode of electromagnetic uh, sunspot activity from the sun can increase our electromagnetic field up to 1%. And when it does, it pinches it. So the stronger it is, the more it is pinched. The lines of force form very close if it is extremely strong. And remember, at about 4,300 years ago, the time when this was all torn up, the time of the flood, it was pinched much closer. So the lines of force would have been there that do the same thing as pressure. Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, under super cold circumstances, we call those cryogenic circumstances, and under a megabars of pressure, took the elements of water. When they got oxygen under super cold circumstances, and under megabars of pressure, oxygen just turned blue. That's what I would have done under those circumstances. So oxygen didn't do anything different. So we erased that. But when they got to hydrogen, they found an amazing thing. When they compressed hydrogen under megabars of pressure, it became a metal. It was transparent and then opaque in different forms. It was crystalline, it was ferromagnetic, it was fiber optic, it was superconductive, and it glowed pink. That puts an entirely different light on the whole subject. Look, a metal, at a certain stage transparent, at another stage opaque. It'll transfer energy. Either way, it works perfectly well. Crystalline, ferromagnetic, that means it's, it holds its magnetic charge. Fiber optic. Now that solves a major problem. Watch this. What was the world like before the flood? Now we're getting to the creation model. You know what fiber optic cable does? Just like Dr. Kimori's fiber optic cable. You can tie it in a knot. Shine a light in one end, the light will follow through the knot, come out the other end. If you have a sphere, a crystalline sphere above the earth, you can't see it, but it presses in on the atmosphere. If you have that crystalline sphere above the earth and the light shines here and it absorbs the wavelength and the energy of the short wave radiation, it transfers that to the opposite side of the globe and the scripture says God made the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. That means the greater light was the sun, but the lesser light was not the moon. We've always assumed the lesser light at night was the moon. The moon was there, but the moon doesn't uh, rule us that well. It doesn't rule the night. It comes and goes. And only once in every 28 days is it full. It comes and goes. So it doesn't rule the night. So look, what we have then is a fiber optic transfer so that at midnight you still have the effect of light and you are ruled by light, incidentally. Your entire biorhythmic circadian clock is set by light. <laughs> Did you know that your clock really is set on a 25-hour basis? But it has to be reset 
daily for a 24-hour basis. It appears that the rotation of the Earth has changed. No wonder we're in trouble. I mean, we're wearing out because our clock has to be reset every day. A lot of other things are wearing us out. You are totally dominated by the effects of light. Did you know that every cell in your body has its own little electromagnetic field? And light or energy or vibration to some degree affects every cell of your body? So the greater light rule the day, the lesser light rule the night. That meant that it was twilight at midnight. But now, let's take it a step further. Fiber optic. Um, now, pink. Then we'll get to superconductive. Pink. Do you remember the color of sunrise? How many have ever been up by sunrise? What's the color of sunrise? It's magenta pink. <coughs> that is the optimal color. We understand that when you look at pink, your brain secretes norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a natural tranquilizer and a neurotransmitter. Weightlifters are not able to lift extremely heavy weights after they look at pink. Because you're not supposed to lift extremely heavy weights. You're not supposed to train your muscles to act like that. Your body just relaxes. But uh, you are supposed to lift more than you currently can lift, by the way. <laughs> so pink has an effect. Neurotransmission, that means uh, norepinephrine, a neurotransmitter, and a natural tranquilizer. You're more relaxed, but notice this. I hope you can pick this up on the cameras. Your nerves don't work too well. Did you know that? <laughs> but they were designed to work perfectly. Your nerves are like this, little arrows with a receptacle and a ball at the end. The next nerve cell doesn't quite fit, and the next doesn't quite fit, but there's a socket there, a groove, but they don't quite fit. They were designed like that for them to work appropriately. Now, without the transmitters in between, They'll work, but you really have to use a lot of energy to get them to work, and, and they work uh, on a short basis, short in the sense of the electrical impulse having problems. But if you fill that gap with appropriate neurotransmitters, which is what happens when you look at pink, then the nerve impulse, the electrical impulse, goes right across unabated. That solves a lot of problems. Most of the depression we have today is a result of the neurotransmitters not being sufficient there. These were designed so that each day this orchestrated universe was refed, and yet at night it slowly depleted so that you would need to recharge the very next day. It's all orchestrated perfectly together. So the pink had a great effect. Pink is my favorite color now. Five years ago, I wouldn't be caught dead looking at pink. Now I have some pink glasses. I put them on as soon as I get in the car. Right, Bo? You've seen the pink glasses. I put them on. I wouldn't drive anywhere without those pink glasses. I can drive eight to 10 hours without fatigue, without major fatigue, and I can think clearly along the way. I started to wear them for the lectures today, but uh, I'm not sure what you would think of a guy up here in pink glasses. <laughs> but pink dominated the sky before the flood. Now, that doesn't mean that everything looked pink or even the sky looked pink. You look at those glasses and they look pink. You look through those glasses, you don't see pink. You see all the colors enhanced. You get the effect of pink. Pink dominates, but things don't look pink to you. It's a wonder world. Now, that does something else. Botanists have found that plants, the growth and reproductive cells of plants are triggered by the pink spectrum of light. Those plants didn't have a chance before the flood. They had to be huge. You've got the added pressure, the added carbon dioxide. Now you're giving them pink light. They had to grow extensively. 
Well, let's take it a step further. Everybody was calmer or should have been calmer before the flood. The plants grew because of the pink. Now let's see what else this will do. This firmament canopy was superconductive. They found that the hydrogen under those circumstances becomes superconductive. That does a lot of things. The big problem we expressed a moment ago was how do you keep that thing up? Just a water vapor canopy won't do it. It'll collapse. NASA found something amazing. I have a photograph of a technician, technician's thumb and index finger, holding a small bit of ceramic superconductive material. It's quite cold, but warm enough where he could hold it in his hand. Holding it like that, he put a dipole magnet on it. You know what happened to the dipole magnet? The Meissner effect. It levitated. It just skipped up in thin air and stayed there. Just held itself in thin air above it. The scientist who found that out at one of the NASA labs said, that's amazing. He had superconductive ceramic material, and he put the little dipole magnet on it. The magnet just levitated up in thin air. He wanted to show his friends, so he started down the hall. And he said, that's wonderful. And he looked up and stumbled. And he looked down and he said, I lost my magnet. Where is it? And he found it dangling in thin air <laughs> underneath the superconductive material. It just holds itself in levitation, above it or below it. That solved a major problem. We'll, we'll take questions later, because I, I might, uh, one question would introduce 32 more. <laughs> so that is the way, apparently, that canopy firmament was held in space, just levitated up there. It had to be superconductive just levitated there. Now that does something else. We have the dipole magnet, the electromagnetic field. At the same time, adjacent to it, we had another field, superconductive field. That introduces an amazing context and concept. The scripture says, in the book of Job, chapter 38, verse 7, that the morning stars sang together. I want to give you something that ought to wake anybody up. This context forms what we call a photomultiplier. The stars are in color. Some are red, some are blue, some are green, some are yellow, some are orange, gold, amber, some are black, some are white, all shades in between. With this photomultiplier effect, light strikes on this side, strikes 10 electrons, and it is enhanced coming out the other side. Whether this is transparent or opaque, either way, you could see the stars before the flood in full color. You could see them on the daytime horizon. Now the scripture says, and let's be academic, but let's see if the scripture is academic. It says that God made the heavenly stellar bodies, Genesis 1, 14 through 18, for days, for signs, for days, months, years. We know how the stars could be for signs for years and for months, but how for days? If it is true, and it is, that every organ of your body has its own electromagnetic field. Your heart has its own electromagnetic field. Your brain, what brain we have, has its own electromagnetic field. Components of it have separate electromagnetic fields. The organs of your body have their own separate electromagnetic fields. In addition to that, every cell of your body has its own electromagnetic field. In addition to that, every water molecule in your body and we're made up of a lot of water, every water molecule in your body is its own separate electromagnetic field. Did you know that? It, it behaves as a unique little electromagnetic field. Then every bit of energy from the universe will affect it in one way or another. If you can see the stars in full color, and even in the daytime, by glancing at the horizon, you could see the stars vividly. It was beautiful before the flood. Who messed it up? We did. When nightfall came, it never got totally dark. 
no insecurity. No insecurity from the nervous system because neurotransmission was complete. No insecurity from the sense of darkness. And at night, twilight all night long, you could see the stars in full color. That being the case, your mind is a wonderful computer. To tell the time each day, you didn't need a watch before the flood. You see, with all of that oxygen, hyperoxygenating the cells of the body and the, and the arteries leading to the brain, you didn't need a notepad to write notes on. You didn't need a watch to tell the time. You could glance at the horizon and your computer would instantly tell you what time it was. It was a wonder world before the flood. Everything was perfectly orchestrated. So you could tell the time, and not only could you tell the time, you could feel the time. Birds migrate by magnetism and starlight. And they don't have to reason it out. They feel it. Electromagnetism dominates the life processes. And the stars would actually give you the time, and it was a wonder world of full color. But let's take it beyond that. You could actually hear the music in the stars. In at least two ways. It was a wonder world, and it's going to be true in the millennium in the future. And all of that's in the book. I won't have time to get to that in this series. Many stars give off nothing but radio signals. And those radio star signals have bursts of energy, and also the light energy of these visible stars have bursts of energy, which, if placed in the right context, watch this, it'll get a little technical. It's called magnetic resonance imaging. Some of you might be involved in hospital work with magnetic resonance imaging. You can actually <coughs> read tissue of the brain without x-ray by uh, putting a certain context in order and the hydrogen in the water um, in the brain structure begins to attenuate, uh, or rather, uh, begins to oscillate. And as it vibrates, it sets in motion a special image. In order to do that, you have to have a very strong field and a weaker field. You have the strong field and the weaker field, so that sets the hydrogen in motion and you actually get the vibrations. You can feel those vibrations in the structure of your body. Those vibrations come across in the form of musical notes. We're actually being serenaded from throughout the universe. It is possible that they came across acoustically as well, because if you get resonance formed in that context, then you can actually hear it acoustically. You probably could hear it, you could at least feel the music in the stars every morning. It was a wonder world. But let's take it a step further. Not only could you feel the music and the domination of the pink light, but the internal structure of the earth was marvelously designed. I want to be sure I keep you awake on this. I'm giving you a lot of advanced research just now. Are you getting all this? If I give an exam at the end of this series, could you pass it? Bo, could you pass it? I, I think probably so. You've heard this two or three times, haven't you? But each time, there's more that's added. Watch. This solves a major, major problem. In the sedimentary rock of the Earth, we have a big problem. We have radioisotopic material, radioactive material, but it all was spewn out of the Earth. The standard evolutionary interpretation of long ages in that rock is suggested by the fact that in that rock is uranium-238 that takes four and a half billion years to lose half its mass. In that rock are other elements that are radioactive. They take much less time to lose their mass, or half their mass. Uh, so uh, they say, well, that's the way you date the rocks. Well, it doesn't pan out. You can get any age you want by using that. You can get any age you want out of any of the rocks by using that method. So that's not the answer. 
let's, um, let's take, find the answer in nature. These radioisotopic materials, radioactive materials, are in sedimentary rock, and they were spewn out of the earth. Let's put them back in the earth. Let's take our coaching from nature. In the granite, where it has not been disrupted, all of those radioactive materials, remember, are in perfect balance. We learned that this morning. They're in perfect balance. They're designed. They never blow up. They all do exactly what they're supposed to do. Let's put this, all of these sedimentary materials back in the earth so it forms foundations. Watch this closely. You get perfectly orchestrated foundations of radioactive material moderated between water and graphite and potassium. All of these are moderating elements. So you get a perfectly balanced interior doing one thing, just one thing, giving off heat. You know what radioactive materials under control do, don't you? They just give off heat. Five miles from the museum is the Comanche Peak Active Nuclear Reactor. It's now online. What's it doing? Just giving off heat. That's all. Just heat. Well, they uh, run pipes through that heated situation, run water through that, that turns to steam, the steam turns the turbine, the turbine turns the generator, the generator feeds electricity to Dallas and Fort Worth. Works nicely. But all you get out of the radioactive materials is heat, but controlled heat. Now that's real nice because inside the earth, before it was all disrupted, and in the next lecture we'll see how it was all disrupted deliberately, inside the earth we had perfectly balanced radioactive foundations. And all they did was simply radiate controlled temperatures to the Tehum, the great reservoir of water. That in turn transmitted through fountains and through radiation in the granite. The granite is neutral unless radiated heat is given to it. And that did something else that gently heated the water table. Why was that necessary? Because when we had the firmament canopy, it filtered out the short wave radiation, and that's much of our heat source. It would let the infrared through, that's some of our heat source, so it would gently warm the temperature during the day so that, see if you can stand this, at night it was about 72, in the daytime about 78 before the flood. That's how it, we take all these factors and program them in. You think you could stand that? <laughs> That would be tremendous. Okay, but watch. Just above the night temperature would be the gentle temperature of these moderating waters. And as that came up through the root systems, the silica, and in the water table, it would gently warm the roots of the plants. These plants don't have a, a chance but to grow. Botanists have found that if you warm the roots two to five degrees above ambient temperature, the plant produces 30 to 50 percent more foliage and fruit. They found that if you add pink light, it produces about 50 percent more growth and fruit. They found that if you add carbon dioxide, it produces 30 to 50 percent more gr uh, growth and fruit. They found that if you add pressure to that, it produces even more. Wow. It appears to me, hopefully to you as well, that this orchestrated model of creation is verified in what we find in the fossil record. It corresponds to the biblical record. And in my opinion, it's a far better explanation for what we find in the fossil record than the evolutionary concept can suggest. Thank you. In a moment, we're going to attempt to disrupt this orchestrated Earth and get the results that we experience today. 
In so doing, let me reflect back to the last lecture for a moment. Some have asked about microevolution, uh, macroevolution, and megaevolution. I didn't use the term megaevolution. Uh, let me clarify the states and statements made were correct. Let me clarify them so that you'll be right on line with me. Microevolution means slow increments from one organism to another. That is not possible. That's what Darwin suggested and postulated. And that would mean that one organism could, be, could evolve into another organism in slow increments. That is not possible with all the laws of biogenesis. It's not possible with all that's being found in genetics. It's not possible with the amount of information. You don't get an acceleration of information. You get a deterioration of information. So microevolution is not possible. That would be Darwinian uh, speculation of one increment added to another. Macroevolution is a special term designated designating variation within genetic boundaries. That is plausible and does occur. We have variation within our genetic boundaries. And uh, some species have developed uh, more fur than others. Some have developed one or another characteristics to adapt to their environment. It's not because they have evolved in the process. It is because genetically they had the capability of adapting. You have the ability to adapt. You have the ability to know when to put a coat on. Now, if you permitted yourself, you could grow a very nice coat around your neck. Some of you ladies, most of you men. <laughs> But for cosmetic purposes, neither of you permit yourself to grow as you're capable of growing. Now, there's another term that I didn't use, and that's mega evolution. Mega evolution means going beyond genetic boundaries, even without increments. And mega evolution is what essentially is taught in punctuated equilibria. That is that there were spurts of growth uh, affected by shortwave radiation affected by ecological circumstances, affected by natural selection, but really that doesn't work in the field. Natural selection weeds out the variance. Natural selection goes back to the common best strain. In the state of Texas, we're now introducing again the best strain that doesn't require our constant attention in the bovine family. That's called the Texas Longhorn. The Texas Longhorn is superior to the Black Angus, the Charlet, superior to the Hereford. Oh, it may not produce as much fat, but we're now learning that you don't want the fat anyhow. It produces 10 more calves over a lifetime than the Hereford can produce. And it's the natural strain. If you leave the cows to themselves and their natural selection, after a while you will get something looking like the Longhorn steer. So natural selection actually weeds out those that are variant and holds to the common best strain. Having said that, we're actually finding that the environment has variation and our current environment has extremes of variation. But the genetic boundaries, genetic material has permitted adaptation to that not because of evolution, but because the Creator added those capacities which would not normally be needed. Illustrated in your life, you don't normally need extreme bursts of adrenaline. But if you stand three feet from Tyrannosaurus rex and it appears that he's breathing down your throat and he's alive, you're going to need that adrenaline. Under normal circumstances, you wouldn't. But under those circumstances, you would need to leap about 12 feet without thinking. Whether he was going to bother you or not, to preclude a heart attack, you would need to leap about 12 feet. So all of it fits together in the research. Now back to the model. The Creator not only orchestrated the heavens with information coming in that you needed. You see, we, um, we need music. We need an inspiration. It appears that programmed on the radio stars and programmed into 
the visible stars is general orchestrated music that is harmonic. The music majors here will understand the harmonics involved in this thing. One picks up another, and that which is not harmonic is not picked up, and it's left. So you actually have a blending of sounds with a beautiful cosmic background, not suggesting the New Age theory or concept, but suggesting an orchestration that would get you ready to sing the rest of the day and uh, inspire you to new songs in the biblical record. Before the flood, they had harps and organs. That means platform instruments and handheld instruments. Why do you think they wanted to create those, invent those? You only invented what you needed. You didn't need a watch. Why not? You could tell the time by the stars. You could feel the time. Wouldn't it be nice to know what time it is and where you are at all times? You could actually feel an orientation. One young man between lectures asked a very intelligent question. It's normally the kids that ask the best questions. There are no unintelligent questions. There are only stupid answers sometimes. He asked a very intelligent question. He said, um, Certain birds have been found with a tiny little nodule of iron, ferrous material. Okay, well, we'll take it beyond. Uh, he said certain birds have been found that way and navigate with lines of force in re response to the ferric material. The ferric material responds, and by the way, how does it respond? Because it holds its electromagnetic field. So we ask, could humans orient like that? Right? Very good question. We have a lot of ferric material in our body, and it is oriented in certain organs appropriately. If you go back in time to 4,300 years ago, the time of the flood, when all of this was ruptured and produced all of that, if you go back in time to 4,300 years ago, when the magnetic field was in stasis, that's when it began to deteriorate. And if before that it was resupplied in energy because you have an overload of energy coming in from the stellar forces, the electromagnetic field out here, the superconductive field, does not need recharging. Any additional energies would bleed over. That means the energies we use up there's conservation of energy, perpetual motion. We don't have it now. It's running down. But there it is in perpetual motion. As long as you have energy being uh, taking the place of what's used, you can have perpetual motion. You say, well, what if all of those radioisotopes and the stars run down? Oh, don't you know there's a principle in the biblical record that he unfolds in every age? a renewal of his activity, when those run down, he'll make more. He's the only one who can, by the way. So you have a constant input. So with that circumstance, and see if I can build the context, all of that says that the electromagnetic field was kept in constant energy storage, didn't run down. There are indications in the past that the intensity of the electromagnetic field had subunits. It had its primary strength, but it had subunits in the form of ley lines. Built in ancient times are certain areas seen in England and throughout Europe, certain <coughs> markers that had greater strength and they, they are equidistant apart. So when you get this in full strength, this dipole magnet takes on ley lines. It is possible, and this young man asked the question, very intelligent question, it is possible that those birds could navigate extremely well, even better than today, considering those ley lines, and it is possible 
that man could feel himself in his environment, could feel secure and know exactly where he was at all times. Wouldn't that be nice? And uh, you wouldn't need a road map. You could get back home. Or well, incidentally, if you could run 200 miles without fatigue, rest 10 minutes, get up and run 150 miles again, you could get to the opposite side of the globe without swimming because it was Pangea. We have termed that Pangea in this orchestral creation model Eretzia, from Eretz, the Hebrew word for the land, for the globe. It was one massive land with an ocean and seas fingering into the land, but you had a beautiful hydrology involved where there were springs and, of course, rivers. And uh, you could get to the other side of the globe by walking or running. Or would you take a Harley Dav uh, Davidson motorcycle? That would just contaminate everything. Why don't we find Mercedes Benz in the fossil record? Because they are far less complicated than all of these. And the rattle of a Mercedes Benz with a few miles on it doesn't match the song of a bird. So they would just contaminate everything. Man was designed and the whole creation orchestrated, including man, with a ferric material in his body, which apparently would give him an orientation. If you knew what time it was, didn't even have to glance at the horizon. You could feel the effects of time. Security would be there. You wouldn't need such things as uh, a bicycle. You would just get in the way. You could get there a lot faster by trotting. You normally wouldn't ride a horse, even though you could if you wanted to. And the horses that are needed for this time after the flood are not the three-toed horses. Those would work better in the marshy lands before the flood, and they've been found in the fossil record. The three-toed horse is no problem. National Geographic admitted that they found hoofed horses along with three-toed horses. So before the flood, the superior horse would be the three-toed horse, but guess which kind the Creator had go on the ark? The hoofed horses, because we were going to have a lot of dry land after the rains were over, after the flood was over. It all balances out. So yes, man, if the strength of the electromagnetic field were greater, and particularly with those sub-ley lines of force, man would be able to navigate and orient and know at all times where he was. It appears that that would be the case. Now, it's better still. That would give man <coughs> an energy field. You see, uh, one reason I wouldn't trade the experience of these 53 years for a 20-year-old mind and body, and I'm serious about that, is that after a while, you build upon the experience, and you build on that and build on that. And you get at a certain level where things really fit together. Maybe. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice to have the body remain at 20 and live for 500 years? That'd be the optimal context. That's what happened there. You, but if everything is perfectly balanced, after a while, you're able to know what time it is. You get music. You invent uh, musical instruments to express the music that you want to create. God is creator, therefore he made us to be creative. So we made instruments to express music that we created from the inspirational music each morning in the stars, Job chapter 38, verse number 7. If then you know where you are at all times, and there's a field which in your body responds to those ley lines, that would mean that you also could sense other organisms about you. That would mean if you wanted to run to Grandma's house in the dark, you could do it. You'd be oriented a lot better. Did you know that certain catfish have a sphere of electromagnetic sensitivity and they're able to sense anything coming within that field? Well, the basic principles in their body would be true to some degree in our bodies before the flood. Looks like we had a wonder world and somebody blew it. Let's learn more about that world. One other factor, and then we'll get it all erased. Right in the heart 
of all this is a cornerstone. That's the iron core. It's solid. Just beyond that is now a molten iron core. Hasn't always been that way. It is molten because it is in contact with some problems here. Now we're talking about the original earth as created. Job chapter 38 mentions a cornerstone, mentions the foundations, mentions the music. All of that is orchestrated together. So here we have a cornerstone. What is a cornerstone? For you builders in the audience, a cornerstone is a stone placed at the beginning of construction, adjacent to the foundation, from which all other points are oriented. Did you get that? It is placed directly adjacent to the foundation, and all other things in that building, every room, every window, every bit of the structure, all of the lines of the masonry, Everything is in reference to that cornerstone. Well, there is in the earth such a cornerstone. It's the central core, the hard, hard iron core. Iron has a very special capability. It's ferric. It's crystalline in structure, and it has the ability to line up all of the crystals in north-south orientation and to keep it that way. It's called a permanent magnet. Watch. Everything in the earth was in relation to that cornerstone, that central core. Everything was oriented to it. The electromagnetic field was absolutely necessary, and it was related to that field. It was kept aligned from that electromagnetic, or from that ferric material, the cornerstone. Incidentally, there's a spiritual cornerstone, and everything in life is in reference to him. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Everything in life is kept aligned by him. Watch. Did you know that without that electromagnetic field, which is kept aligned because of that cornerstone, you would not be here? NASA ran a very special experiment suggested by an 11th grade student. They took some eggs, I think 21 altogether. Each egg had been fertilized a separate amount of time. When they sent them up beyond the effect, major effect of the electromagnetic field, one had been fertilized one day, one, two, three, four, all the way up to day 21. They sent them beyond the effect of the Earth's electromagnetic field, primary, uh, the greater effect, brought them back, continued to incubate them. Every egg that had been fertilized on the Earth, eight days or more, hatched except one. You know, you have an accident here and there. But not a single egg that had been fertilized on the Earth less than seven days hatched. Why is that so significant? By that they found that mitosis, the cell division in the embryo, could not occur for the life-continuing processes, even though the thing was alive. You know, life begins at conception. So for the chicken, life begins at fertilization. Even though it was alive, it could not, the cells could not divide for life to continue, even though life was there, except in the presence and under the influence of the electromagnetic field. Did you get that? So beyond that field, those eggs that had been fertilized eight days or more, even though they went beyond that field, they still hatched because the mitosis had begun appropriately had been aligned appropriately, all because of the electromagnetic field. Well, that field is absolutely necessary. Even after you were conceived, you could not have developed as an embryo without the effect of that electromagnetic field. Life processes 
could not go on without that. Well, spiritually, the real cornerstone is Jesus Christ. Life without him is not life at all. It's not straight. He keeps everything oriented. I thought you'd appreciate that. Then let's take it a step further. Here we have a world oriented with the electromagnetic field, resupplied in the energy of that electromagnetic field, uh, the cornerstone keeping it oriented, the energy resupplied by the input of energy, light coming in that influences us musically and electromagnetically. We're able to see the stars in full color, able to anticipate and receive the music of the stars. Uh, temperature 72 to 78 each day. The plants gently warmed from the roots at night. And our biorhythms kept intact at a 25 hour cycle rather than the 24 hour cycle so that everything was designed not to run down. It was designed to go on and on and on. In addition to that, inside the earth, you have these foundations of radioactive material. This is important. As they simply give off heat, in the process, it takes four and a half billion years for uranium to lose up half its mass. You still have half of it after that. After that, you still have half. But someone will object and say, well, after about 20 billion years, you're going to run out of most of the uranium. No problem, because if you align the uh, radioactive materials just right, you end up with as much fissionable material from breeder reactor context as you started with, as long as the energy source is still there and the energy source is still there. So essentially, this interior of the earth, the furnace was in the basement. Because we didn't have the great heat factor from outer space, that was all controlled. The furnace was in the basement. And it would go on forever, forever, and forever. And you were designed to go on forever. The whole thing was orchestrated. Are you getting that? Perfectly balanced. Everything was orchestrated. Additionally, man was in tune with all of nature. And they were all his friends. The only dangerous thing was man. But because the very imagination of his heart was only evil continually, in mercy the Creator shortened life. How did he do it? Well, the scripture says how he did it, and we can approximate that in the laboratory. Let's see if we can do it. The scripture states that God uttered his voice, and the earth melted. Is that physically true? That's physically true. God uttered his voice and the earth melted. How is that possible? Watch. Here we have a shell to the earth, the granite crust. We have a perfect environment. Inside that we have the Tehum, the great deep. Underneath that we have the perfectly balanced foundations with nuclear reactors the energy source, we have the moderators, water acts as a moderator, magnesium, sulfur, all of those things operate. We have the core inside, everything is perfectly balanced. We have the firmament above. Now, the scripture states in Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 and 12, that in the 600th year of Noah's life, the second month, 17th day of the month, something special happened. In this order, the fountains of the great deep were broken up, the windows of heaven were open, and it began to rain. In that order. Watch the following. How is that possible? Given the earth as having a crust of granite, which it does, given the internal materials as they are with a lot of water, you have a very special context. And the scripture states that God, I don't know how to draw God, God uttered his voice and the earth melted. Is that plausible? Yes, it is. Voice is simply vibratory energy. Starlight and sunlight is vibratory energy at a different level. You can't yell that loud, but God can. Energy vibrating at two and a half billion times per second 
is very special energy called microwave. Energy vibrating at 8 hertz, very slow, is the energy of the electromagnetic field in vibration. By the way, that's the perfect vibratory rate for your body, for the human physiology. Now, what happens if you intensify that vibratory energy of the voice to two and a half billion times per second? That's microwave energy. How many of you have a microwave oven at your house? Now, I hope someone in this audience has done this and will help me out by admitting that you've done this. Has anyone ever taken an egg? The earth was like an egg. I'm not saying it was living inside, but it certainly had the same elements of an egg inside. And a crust, a solid crust. Has anyone ever taken an egg? Just a common hen egg. Intact. Don't punch a hole in it. Don't break it. Now, promise you won't do this after this lecture, please. <laughs> Who has taken a common hen egg? You have. You put it in a microwave. You close the door and push the little button. Tell us loudly and clearly, sir, what happened? I had to play the inside of the microwave for a while. <laughs> you mean that egg exploded? A few chunks and a lot of pieces, right? What happened to your microwave? You're, you're very fortunate. One fellow said that he owns a ranch, and some of his hired help just walked in and put two of those things in. Two of them in the microwave, closed the door, and I mean, you know, they were out punching cattle, and they thought, we'll have a poached egg. They put two of them in, closed the door, pushed the button, and the explosion was so violent, it blew not only the door open, but it had a safety latch on the thing, and it blew the door open and the safety latch off. I was lecturing in one audience, and a fellow related that the microwave company uh, replaced the microwave if the man promised he would never do this again. <laughs> he put a simple egg, one egg, in the microwave, closed the door, pushed the little button. The explosion was so violent, it actually blew a hole in the roof of the microwave, and some of the eggs splattered on the ceiling. Now, uh, did you do something like, what did you do? Tell us loudly, please, for the sake of the cameras. Did you, uh, did you do that after you heard me lecture on, uh, now, but you were not supposed to do that. You failed the class if you, uh, tell us loudly what happened. You put an egg in a microwave and push the button and what happened? All it did was blow up the egg. Well, blowing up the egg is what you were supposed to do. But really, you weren't supposed to do anything, you know. <laughs> but uh, tell me, did the book prove to be right? It explodes, doesn't it? Well, the physics, ladies and gentlemen, are the same. With an egg, as with a globe, if you have enough energy. You don't have that much energy, but God has. What do you call it when you have a unit which has radioactive material perfectly balanced, and all of a sudden, for some reason, the imbalance goes off, either to human, due to human error in design or human error in the operation of the nuclear reactor? What do you call it when you're in Russia and um, you have a nuclear reactor going real well, but all of a sudden you get those nuclear materials imbalanced? What do you call that? A Chernobyl. I gave this lecture to a group of people, and in the audience was a nuclear scientist, uh, an engineer, actually. He raised his hand and he said, Sir, that'll work. The physics are right. I said, What do you call a Chernobyl? He said, We never have one. I said, But if you had one, what do you call it? He said, We'll never have one. I said, But theoretically, if the thing goes out of disruption, and you have a Chernobyl. He said, I know what you're fishing for. You call it a meltdown. That's right. That's exactly what Chernobyl was, a meltdown. Well, the scripture says, Psalm 46, 6, God uttered his voice and the earth melted. And there's proof of it. Two years ago, we thought the interior of the earth was 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 
we now know it's 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It is hotter inside the earth in certain areas, particularly in that molten area of the ferric core, the cornerstone. It's solid and then it's molten near there. Indications are that it's hotter there than it is on the surface of the sun. That's pretty hot. Well, why is it so hot? Was it designed to be like that? It wasn't designed to be like that. <laughs> Instead, <coughs> once you have a disruption, one reaction leads to another reaction, and what's going on inside the Earth today cannot be explained by pressure and gravitational attraction. It can only be explained by nuclear reaction. Walter T. Brown, Ph.D., who is indirectly associated with the museum, is a great scholar. Dr. Brown found an amazing thing. He put this model in the computer. He had the firmament canopy above. He had the crust of the earth. He had internal materials. And he found that actually you don't need to have enough energy to blow the whole thing up. You only need enough energy to trigger it that will heat some of the water out of balance. You see, what happens with the water is that the dimension of the water molecule is the same dimension as the wavelength of microwave energy. And that water molecule gets the whole blast of microwave energy. And it absorbs it. Absorption of that energy adds to the heat. The heat adds to the pressure. Pressure adds to the heat. The heat adds to the pressure. And simply by becoming unbalanced, just a slight imbalance, the heat adds to the pressure, the pressure adds to the heat, the heat adds to the pressure, and pretty soon it begins to disrupt the whole thing. And Dr. Brown found that just like the egg does in the microwave oven, the same thing occurs in this enclosure. And after a short while, those waters actually rip, and he found just like in that microwave oven, that there are a few chunks, but thousands of pieces. It actually rips that whole thing apart two and a half miles per second. And I'm trying to draw this as if it were on the surface. Dr. Brown found that the earth was ripped apart at the seams, like ripping a tennis ball or a basketball apart. It was ripped apart at the seams. The whole thing took less than eight minutes two and a half miles per second. In less than eight minutes, the entire Earth was ripped apart at the seams. Now, it was not separated at the seams. It was ripped apart, but the separations occurred slowly after the flood. It took a century after the flood before the separations were complete. It was ripped apart, but we found something else. As the rippage occurs, primarily because of the waters, if you were to take a rapid shutter camera and observe that microwave intensity and that uh, egg <coughs> exploding in the microwave, you would find that the first thing that happens is it ruptures a large hole in one side. Simultaneously, it continues the rupture until all the fracture lines meet. Well, is there a spot on the globe that shows the rupture? Yes. Between the continents worldwide is, called, is what is called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge, the longest mountain range on Earth. It's 47,000 miles long. It's between all of the continents. It's right in the heart of the ocean, between all of them except the South Pacific. In the South Pacific, there's what's called the Ring of Fire. There's more volcanic activity around the South Pacific than any other place. And it appears that the great rupture occurred there, but then the continental division occurred simultaneously around the rest of the globe. But Dr. Brown found something else. These waters in the computer want to shoot a jet of water 70 miles high. How high would that canopy have been? About 11 miles. The first hot waters would have shot against the canopy. Now, to break that, the strength <coughs> of that superconductive field, metallic structure, hydrogen in metallic form, would actually, there's only one way to do it. You couldn't shoot a rocket through it. 
That means we had no space travel before the flood. That solves a big problem. Couldn't get through it. Man was smart enough, but man had such echospherical balance here, except for his heart, that there was no need to go up there. And he couldn't get, couldn't get through it. But the rippage, remember what happened the first day of the flood, Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, 600th year of Noah's life, second month, 17th day of the month, number one, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. That was the first occurrence. Number two, the windows of heaven were open. Not only just a window poking up into that, but actually directly above the continents, there would be a jet spray of water so that if you stood on the earth and were unfortunate enough not to have gotten in the ark and unfortunate enough not to have been destroyed the first few moments of the flood, those were the lucky ones, and you watch that thing, it would actually rip channel windows into that firmament canopy corresponding to the channel ripping the earth into continents. Remember, the separation of the continents didn't occur until later. Then, with this ripped, not simply a hole ripped in it, but the whole thing ripped into a, a heavenly continent, it begins to collapse at the edges. And that collapse comes down as rain. But at the poles, it would come because the lines of force spread out, it would come down in pellets of ice and form ice caps and introduce the ice ages. So we have here a plausible mechanism to explain how we got where we are. Now, what's the result? After this lecture, I'll spend the next lecture time giving you the tangible evidence is found at Glen Rose that all of this is true or to the point that we can verify it. But we've taken the model into increments beyond which we physically have found evidence for, but there's academic evidence for all of this. What's the result? Well, now the canopy starts to rain down. Take a reference in your Bibles, please. Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 15 and 16. And that states in verse 15, that God made the earth by his power, his wisdom, his understanding. He took his power, number one. Everything that we experience, including the little whirling worlds called atoms, the combination of those whirling worlds into molecules and chemical reactions, everything we are, everything we see physically, we're told by physicists, is simply whirling energy in motion, right? Who had the energy to start with? Who put it into articulated form? The Creator Himself. And He orchestrated every bit of it. Well, when He did so, everything was balanced perfectly. Jeremiah 51, 15. He created the earth, His wisdom, His power, His understanding. He put it all together with absolutely perfect balance. And then he came down and met with man in the cool of the day. Then verse 16 changes tenses. It speaks in the present. Now we have rains. We have the water cycle. And verse number 16 shows the current disposition. And it speaks about that which wasn't known before, rain, etc. So what made the difference? The collapse of the firmament collapsed the mechanism for keeping the electromagnetic field of the earth charged. So the electromagnetic field of the earth began to lose its energy. Our real problem today in the environment is that ultraviolet radiation is coming through. It's coming through at an alarming rate. Before the flood, that ultraviolet short wave energy could not get through. It was trapped in the water of the firmament. So you had no ultraviolet problem. What, what is the ultraviolet problem? Well, it's simply this. That short wave energy coming through now at an alarming rate strikes your skin. 
it introduces uh, in the nucleus of the cell damage that causes cellular diversion. We call that cancer. That introduces cancer to the deep cell tissue of the body. The Environmental Protection Agency has announced that in a matter of decades, one out of three people will die of cancer introduced by ultraviolet radiation that would not have had cancer otherwise. So we're, we're destroying, we're being destroyed. That's not all. That ultraviolet radiation strikes molecules in the atmosphere, strikes oxygen. Oxygen becomes aggressive what we call the free radical. It does bizarre things to chemistry. Uh, nutrient uh, experts say that the real problem in nutrition is the free radical. We get bizarre chemical arrangements, and the chemistry of fruit doesn't do what it's supposed to do, or very little of what it's supposed to do. We eat that. Uh, it's absorbed and bonds to our cell structure. We're in trouble. What's the alternative? Don't eat you'll be in trouble then. So we're dying slowly. But man didn't begin to die at that rate immediately after the flood. Noah lived how many years before the flood? 600 years. How many years after the flood? 350. Even after the flood, how could he live that long? Here's the reason, we think. Because the electromagnetic field was still very strong. It wasn't being recharged, but it was still very strong. It was strong enough to where it could hold a number of water molecules by the trillions in suspension. We didn't have the firmament any longer. The hydrogen compressed metal in the firmament rained down, but we did have a canopy. Water was in suspension up there. We had a canopy. We understand from ancient history that even after the flood, you could feel the music in the stars for a while. That means the mechanism for picking that up was still there. The strength of the electromagnetic field and water molecule where the hydrogen begins to go into resonance. So <coughs> that would work. That means that the ultraviolet radiation was not streaming in until we lost energy in that electromagnetic field. You've heard, it's been announced globally, that our problem is the CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, and that is a little problem. But did you know that one volcanic eruption belches out a million times more CFCs than man uses in an entire year? There's violence in nature. It's imbalanced now. And the CFCs are, the, are a big problem, but not nearly the problem that is introduced by this concept. Why can the CFCs even affect that? We're losing so much energy in the electromagnetic field that it can't hold particles in suspension, so even the ozone is coming out. The big problem is not the CFCs, even though they contribute a little bit. The big problem is the fact that the Earth's electromagnetic field is so weak now, it can't hold particles in suspension. It looks like whoever wound this thing up needs to come back and wind it up again. He will. He's in total control. So even after the flood, Noah could live for 350 years until he was 950. But if you'll follow the record, there is an exponential decay of the ages of man's life until it finally leveled off. A man's very fortunate if he has three score and ten. Each generation <coughs> diminished in the longevity of their life, and that totally matches the Earth's electromagnetic field decay. Now we're in real trouble. In the book, there's a lengthy chapter that I do not have time nor energy today to go into, but it shows the restoration of the canopy. Let me encapsulate once again in this lecture and in the final lecture, we'll give you details of the actual evidences at the Creation Evidences Museum and in excavation that show that creation model is verified and the evolutionary model is totally destroyed. Today we've learned that the Earth and the entire universe 
were created with orchestration. We've learned that they were created not long ago. We've learned that the balance was that they were designed to go on forever. But due to the fact that the very imagination of man's heart was only evil continually, a merciful creator diminished the span of man's life in mercy. Why? Because of heaven and hell? You see, is hell an academic reality? Yes, it is. It's not simply a scriptural truth, it's an academic reality. You see, um, once you're complete in positive and negative, at one with your Creator, then you just go off. Positives and negatives attract, and the only way to unbind them is to have a greater force active. There is no greater force than the Creator, right? So we're complete. We go off with Him. That, you know, the two positives repel. The Creator is the Master. If an individual, on the other hand, says, I'm a positive, I will not surrender, I must be my own master, whether he rejects knowingly and deliberately the biblical record, or whether he, once he's reached the status of accountability, rejects simply out of self-will. Either way, all men do the same thing, and ladies too. We become our own positive. Two positives repel. It's impossible for them to coexist if you have not responded to the mercy extended from the Creator, then uh, you're not bonded with Him. You cannot go off of that unit. You must be repelled. Those are laws of nature. I spoke to a small group of skeptics near St. Louis, Missouri. The leader of the group was named Stephen. He looked at me after a couple of hours of discourse and said, uh, Sir, I will not accept your position of creation. I will not accept the biblical record. I want you to know that my mind is really a series of electrical impulses. I said, you're correct. He said, after this life, I will not cease to live. I will go my own way. I don't want your creator. I'll go my own way, and I won't cease to live. I said, you're right, Steve. But I said, that's not the end of it. While you will not be complete in the Creator, you go your own way, you're your own independent positive, repelled and by and repelling the other positive so that you can't meet. At the same time, you go your own way. You know there are laws in physics. All charged particles, sooner or later, find themselves gravitating to a field of force called a black hole, and sooner or later you'll find yourself all that's left of you, which will not die, being attracted there. And the description of that black hole is identical to the biblical description of hell, where there is no hope of fellowship with the Creator that's settled forever, where there is no hope of ever getting out of the gravitational attraction. No light gets out. No particles get out. The intense heat is beyond calculation and description. I said, if that's what you want, that's what you get, but you have a choice. I'm saying that even physically, the fact of hell and the ultimate gravitation of all consciously charged units find themselves in total alignment with the laws of physics. On the other hand, those who want to be identified with the Creator and complete in Him 
simply must surrender to him through the merits and person of his son who expressed him to us. Thank you. We have spent most of the day in the seminar analyzing and comparing the two uh, in comparisons of the two models. There are only two models: the evolutionary and naturalistic concept, uh, in varying degrees or forms, or supernatural special direct creation. We call that scientific creationism. At the same time, we have seen that the scientific creation model parallels the biblical creation model and exclusively the biblical creation model, incidentally. It does not parallel the model of other religious forms of creation. Those other religious forms take bizarre turns which cannot be substantiated in a systematic, succinct, outline paradigm, the creation model. Only the biblical record parallels that. But that does not mean that the model is not academic. It is, in fact, more scientific than is the evolutionary model. I hope you have seen that. What we have dealt with here is observation in theory and observation in the laws of physics and science. I think you would agree that everything stated throughout the seminar has a solid foundation in scientific analysis. Now, the final proof of the model is that we find it in the fossil record. A number of <coughs> evolutionary scholars have admitted that the only place to prove or falsify either model is in the fossil record itself. Well, let's examine the fossil record. We could spend the rest of the day and the weekend discussing various things that have been found in the fossil record. For instance, not too many months ago, a gentleman came to the museum, spoke of uh, a statement that his father had given, went to his father, has a signed statement of that. Some years ago, back in West Virginia, they were working in coal mines over a mile below the surface. Now, that's a long way down in coal mines. And working between layers of coal, they broke through a seam and found a pocket, which had apparently at one time been a water pocket, but all the water had uh, been assimilated into the adjacent material. It was now just an air pocket. When they broke into this pocket, a small room approximately the size of this platform, the men who broke in were absolutely aghast at what they saw. First-hand witnesses of this still live. They saw in colified form human bodies. I don't mean the skeletons. The human bodies, noses, everything about them, ears, everything intact, but in colified form. The total bodies. They found them all over the floor, in the sides, in the ceilings. They were so realistic. They were colified and coal, incidentally, can be made in a matter of hours in the lab. All you need is the original carbonaceous material, whether plant or animal, water, heat, and pressure. And you can get coal in a matter of hours. So uh, they stood aghast at what they saw. Colified human remains. They brought the state archaeologist in. He looked at them and said, well, they're human remains. Somehow the Indians must have found a way down here and uh, learned how to cremate their dead. The dead were not cremated. They were colified, which requires a very special process, but a process found throughout nature and in the fossil record. They said the, the Indians must have found a way down here. A mile and a half down through coal, through various beds of coal and stone, absolutely impossible. So what did they do? They first restricted the area, rescinded the permit of the coal mining company, built a dam over the whole thing, and built a reservoir, permanently flooded the thing, and filled it in with silt. Is that academic? It's not academic at all. That's religious. That's humanistic religion 
which refuses to permit an alternate concept to be expressed. Well, much of what we have found at Glen Rose and in academic research attendant to the work at the Creation Evidences Museum has been um, globally challenged because, admittedly, in print, some of the leading evolutionary scholars have stated that if we can verify that man and dinosaur existed simultaneously, that totally destroys the concept of normal biological order in evolutionary explanation and strongly favors creationism. I think they're right. Well, what evidences do we have? First of all, I brought with me to this seminar, which I rarely do. What I have with me today is rarely ever taken out of safety deposit. I brought with me a very special fossil that's a tooth. This is the Hesperopithecus man, the Nebraska man. You scholars will remember that Hesperopithecus was introduced. I don't think they displayed the actual fossil, but they introduced uh, the find in uh, the famous Scopes Evolution trial in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. It was the weight of that evidence that won the case ultimately for the evolutionist and introduced evolution into the public school system. Hesperopithecus. Now, all they had found at that time, Harold Cook being the excavator and the geological analyst, sending the fossil to Henry Fairfield Osborne, one of America's leading paleontologists in New York, all they had at one time was a tooth, just a tooth. Now, that was 1925 that won the case ultimately for the concept of evolution. In 1926, Harold Cook, the same geologist, went back to the same gravel pit in Nebraska, dug in the same area, found the rest of the skeleton. Dr. Henry Fairfield Osborne had stated that it was the greatest evidence for evolution ever found. He said it obviously appears to be much like a molar of a simian, lower primate, a monkey, an ape, but it has very strong identifying similarities to the molar of Homo sapien, higher primates. So he said, obviously, it's ape graduating to be man. It's intermediate. It's a missing link. Therefore, we name him Hesperopithecus, the Nebraska man. Actually, technically, Hesperopithecus Harold Cookai, named after the uh, discoverer. Well, it was 1925. It won the case. 1926, Harold Cook went back to the same place, found the rest of the specimen, including the rest of the jaw and this tooth. This tooth was not the tooth used in the Scopes Evolution trial, but it came from the same jaw of the tooth that was used. What did it turn out to be? Was it an ape? Was it from a man? Was it intermediate? None of the above. It's a pig's tooth. It turned out to be peccary, just a pig. That's all, an extinct pig. Well, they have some teeth that look remarkably like our teeth, and quite often we uh, simulate the pig in our eating habits. <laughs> Dr. Dwayne Gish, a good friend of mine and a great creation scholar and debater, and said they tried to make a man out of a pig's tooth, but instead the pig made a monkey out of the man. <laughs> I think he might have a point there. But that was not found at Glen Rose. This was. This was found about 25 years ago, recently placed in our possession the Creation Evidences Museum. It is a fossilized finger. You see, what's the difference? The evolutionary community tried to make, out of this tooth, a life form that didn't exist, that could not be matched, intermediate, in between. It's not what we're trying to do. We're taking a fossil that perfectly matches a living form today. 
And if it matches perfectly, we can say with academic assurance that it came from that life form. I need the help of someone. Would you help me? Need a lady to stand right here. Need your finger. Just take it off. That's okay. <laughs> this finger. First, I need you to examine it. Do you see what certainly appears to be a fingernail? Cuticles? Do you see what appears to be the medial joint? A finger joint from the medial joint forward? Inside, you see replaced material that matches the bone marrow, the bone shaft, even the epidermis and the skin texture. Well, if those individuals could be coalified a mile and a half down in the coal mines, before the coal mines were there, and if dinosaur tissue, flesh, and skin have been preserved intact in fossilized form, that is, they've been replaced, certainly it's possible for a human finger to be, right? Well, let's see if this is masculine or feminine. We men have a rather blunt finger terminus normally. Uh, let's see your index finger or any finger. Would you say that's a fair match? Where is the camera? Is that a fair match? I ask you to judge. Is that a fair match? Would you say that certainly appears to be a human finger. Okay, thank you. Give her a hand. I recently lectured to all of the biology classes at Glen Rose High School. I do that every year on scientific creationism. To each class, I gave the evolutionary model and the creation model in brief. And then... Um, I took out of safety deposit the finger because I live at Glen Rose and we keep the finger in safety deposit there. I did not let them touch the finger because every time we touch it, we'll leave some acids and oil there. But I had every class analyze the finger from the internal structure to the external structure and I ask each class at the close, what does this appear to be? And physiologists have come to the same conclusion. Each class said, it's a human finger. And I said, what does this one artifact do to the theory of evolution? And every class to the last man simply grinned and said, it totally destroys the concept of evolution, that fossil. And you get to see it. How does it destroy, destroy the concept of evolution? In the following way, let's go back to the chart, the geologic chart. By the standard evolutionary concept, life began to express itself with the trilobites about 600 million years ago, graduated in complexity until we finally find man at the top. But man did not appear until about 2 million years ago. But if we find evidence that man existed down here with the dinosaurs in Cretaceous period, that certainly either brings man down here or brings the dinosaurs up there, everything into recency. Either way, it destroys the concept of evolution because we have no precursor forms leading up. Even if evolution were plausible, we have no preceding precursor forms leading up. So therefore, that fossil destroys the concept of evolution. Now, I have another fossil. Each of these is priceless. This was found, this hammer was found 56 years ago, this June, totally encased in Ordovician stone. Ordovician stone, by standard evolutionary assignment, and I do emphasize assignment, there is no way to prove that any of that stone is more than a few hundred years old because the stone is laid down very rapidly the stone is laid down successively, cyclically, so that they have polystrate fossils that go layer after layer after layer after layer. And the effect of the moon during the year of the global flood would have actually encased all of these fossils in calcium carbonate, the resonance over the waters. All right, if you have this case, there is no way to prove any of that stone is any older than any of the rest of it. 
To date, the evolutionary community has gotten away with a concept. They've said, we analyzed this stone and found that truly it is 322 million years old. Well, they found certain radioisotopes in it with a half-life analysis, and we've disproved the half-life analysis earlier this afternoon. With a half-life analysis, they can put that age on it. But what they don't say is, in the very same stone, we also find half-life radioisotope analysis that makes it 3,000 years old. We find some other that makes it 4 billion years old. Therefore, they select exactly what they want. And they've gotten away with it until now. But part of our job is to get everybody to tell the truth. Don't you wish everybody would tell the truth, including all Christians? Now, Ordovician stone, by standard evolutionary assignment, is 435 million years old. What's a hammer doing down there? <laughs> now, really, all of the stone is very recent, other than the granite. The granite is probably a little over 6,000 years old. The rest of the stone is sedimentary, about 4,300 years old, and then there's a little bit that's been made since then. But stone is not normally being made. It has to be made very rapidly because of the calcium carbonate chemical composition. So to find a hammer down there is a major problem. I took the hammer to Battelle Lab in Columbus, Ohio. Dr. Otho Perkins, a leading evolutionary scholar, looked at it that morning, and he said that we're going to have to rewrite Earth history as a result of this. It's genuine. There's no question it's genuine. And he's an evolutionary scholar. And he said, uh, <coughs> maybe <coughs> it dropped out of the sky as a meteorite. And then he explained, he said, maybe it fell as a meteorite and some smart Indian carved it. Well, it's a problem there because it has a shaft in one end. Pretty hard to carve a shaft in it. But not only that, there's uh, another problem. He said, you'll know if it's meteoritic in origin because all meteoritic iron has nickel in it. And that's true. All iron that falls out of the space, and there are little globules of iron that fall out of space, and big, big globules of iron. The object is just not to be standing in the place where they fall. How do you know if you get hit by it? You'll never know if you get hit by one. <laughs> just thank the Lord for the day you have, and pray one won't fall on your head. So uh, he said, uh, Perhaps it fell out of the sky as a meteorite and some smart Indian found it and carved that. He said, you'll know at Battelle Lab where you're going to be this afternoon. We were scheduled to be there that afternoon and were. He said, you'll know because all meteoritic iron has nickel in it. That afternoon I took it to Battelle. We did a scanning electron microprobe elemental analysis. That is a beam of electrons streaming down into it to see what it was made of. Turns out to be 96.6% iron, almost pure iron, 96.6% iron, 0.74% sulfur, less than 1% sulfur, 2.6% chlorine. Hmm. How much nickel? 0 0.0. None. No nickel. Didn't fall out of the sky. It came, the original material came from the earth. Incidentally, the biblical record says in Genesis chapter 4 that before the flood, in that pre-flood context, a man named Tubal Cain taught artisans in the use of brass and iron. This is an artisan's hammer. If you look closely the cavity, don't touch it, but if you look closely the cavity surrounding that head, the cavity has a circular configuration, meaning that there was a mallet head sleeve on the top of that. That's what you use for working delicately in metals. You pulverize one end and then beat them out into contour with the other. It appears that that's an artisan's hammer used for working in metal. Does that match the pre-flood context? Yes. First of all, it has 96.6% uh, iron, 0.74% sulfur, 2.6% chlorine. We can compound chlorine with metallic, uh, with uh, ferric material in liquid form and in powder form, but we cannot compound chlorine in metallic 
with metallic iron. To do so would require the total removal of ultraviolet radiation because we can't compound it with iron because oxygen is so aggressive because of the ultraviolet penetration that the oxygen grabs the iron and doesn't give the chlorine a chance to do so. In liquid form, we can do it because the oxygen can't get in through the liquid. But we can't do so in metallic form. So in order to do this, you're going to have to totally remove the ultraviolet penetration. How do you do that? You've got to have a shield around the Earth, a firmament canopy around the Earth. In other words, to fabricate this at all requires the canopy. The whole environment has to be right. In addition to that, there is a little area there where 56 years ago, when they first found it, chipped the top of the stone off. The material was already fossil coated. That's not rust, that's fossil coating. They took a file and seared through that coating to see what the metal looked like underneath. It was shiny bright. Professor Ian Taylor called me from Toronto, Canada. He said, we've observed a documentary that you did. And he said, in our opinion, at the lab here at the university in Toronto, this is a genuine pre-flood artifact. I said, scientifically, how do you know? He said, because if it will not rust where it was seared, and he said, rust forms in nature, Fe203 or Fe304. And he said, if it will not rust, there has to be iron oxide on the surface of it and that has to be straight FeO. I said, how do you make FeO? He said, there's only one way. We have to have a chamber with at least two atmospheres of pressure shielded from ultraviolet radiation. It's nice, the whole atmosphere was such a chamber before the flood. So we're very gratified with that. And uh, I cannot tell you what it costs to get that. It's priceless. When I travel with it, I sleep with it. Literally, I had it beside the bed last night. I won't tell you where the bed was. <laughs> Don't you trust me? That's not the point. The point is, if it were dropped and ruined, a priceless artifact would be destroyed. Now, we come to what has been <coughs> at the heart of the controversy at Glen Rose. In 1908, the first dinosaur tracks were found after a flash flood ripped up a ledge of limestone. When the waters went down, there were some huge chicken tracks there. <laughs> but they weren't chicken tracks. It turned out to be dinosaur tracks. That was 1908. In 1910, a fellow named Charlie Moss examined the riverbed after another flash flood had ripped up another ledge of limestone. He found perfectly preserved, depressed human footprints among the dinosaur prints. In 1940, the Burdick print was cut out. We uh, have now found the layer of stone <coughs> from which it came. We've not found the immediate area, but we found the stone which matches it perfectly from inclusions, everything about it. So it does match the Glen Rose limestone in at least that one layer, and finding that layer is all we needed. If you'll observe this closely without touching it, you'll find the great toe, second, third, fourth, little toe, the ball, the flange, the medial arch, the heel calcaneous section, the lateral arch, even the slight bulge at the base of the fifth metatarsal. That means that it could only have been made by a very modern man or woman. It's feminine, by the way. It's 14 inches long. The lady stood about seven, three, or four. I say about, she could stand as tall as she wanted to. And nobody could disprove. How do we know it's feminine? Because of the narrowness of the heel in relation to the rest of the track and because of the, of the relative narrowness of the great toe. You ladies have a more narrow great toe and a more narrow heel than a man. How many knew that? A couple, one man, two ladies. <laughs> so that indicates in all probability that it was feminine. The evolutionist printed a 12-page article or 10-page article in Natural History magazine. I was mentioned 12 times in it, not favorably, <laughs> and that doesn't bother me in the least because the work we're doing is controversial only to those 
who refuse to accept the truth. And they have admitted in print that if we can verify human occupation among dinosaurs, the theory of evolution is in trouble. Well, we've done that, but whether we could do that or not, the theory was in trouble to begin with. Now, recently, uh, they stated in Natural History magazine that it's too perfect. It's all five of the toes. It's obviously a carving. Recently, we had it sectioned. Let me back up a paragraph. About 20 years ago, they sectioned it across the flange and the ball of the foot footprint at Loma Linda University, assuming since that's the deepest area, that's not quite the deepest, the heel slightly deeper, but since that's one of the deepest areas, that would show the lamination. It did not show lamination. So even creation is said, must be a carving. Well, recently we determined, uh, now the museum has it permanently, but Dr. Clifford Burdick is 95 and he's not gonna be with us much longer, so we wanted to section it further before he died, so we would be able to let him know that he was vindicated before he died. Well, in our research at Glen Rose, we found some rather unusual things. In forward locomotion, you don't walk straight. Did you know that? You waddle. You waddle with a spring. So do I. I used to have more spring in my waddle than I do now. We actually place weight on the heel, transfer it to the lateral outside, transfer that weight to the ball and great toe, and transfer that forward. And as we do, the great toe is extended, but the other four toes curl to give us part of the spring. And that curl is mandated by the muscular structure to which it's attached. You're all orchestrated. Everything was orchestrated. Did you get that through the lectures today? Everything was balanced to begin with. Now things are out of balance. Well, if the toes, if the other four toes are splayed, that is, they're extended out, that means the guy was not, the girl was not walking in normal forward locomotion. That means she actually was turning. And we realized that she was, in all probability, turning left. Well, that means that the greater pressure would not be under the flange, but would be under the heel and under the toes. Because if you're turning left, what you actually do is balance the area to begin with. You balance the area at the flange, and you actually place the weight on the splayed toes, and you keep that weight on the forward portion of the foot and turn like this. Try it sometime. It'll work. That's the only way it will work comfortably. So the greater pressure would be on the toes, not on the ball of the foot because in the, in the turn, you actually would level the weight on the balls, but keep the weight on the toes to begin with and then uh, press it down even further. So we section the heel. Sure enough, the lamination pressure lines are there. It's genuine. Then we section twice across the toes. We found that not only under the toes do you have the lamination pressure ridges, <coughs> but under the great toe, you have a very deep one it depresses down and then it shifts to the left, two separate lamination series. So the lady was turning left like that. First she balanced her weight forward and then she pulled it like that. That's exactly what you do if you're turning left and you're sensitive, you actually pull it so that some of the weight would press to the side. So I'm saying that this is a genuine human footprint made among dinosaur footprints. Now, have you learned anything? Now let's take your questions. We have come to a special time that I always enjoy, and that is checking your questions, if you have any. You've seen actual tangible evidences. Do you understand why we claim that in the work of that little museum at Glen Rose, the research has actually shown that the theory of evolution is falsified. It's falsifiable and we have falsified it, showing that it is in error. Uh, I think he wants you to come to the microphone. If you have a question, please come around and stand in line at the microphone. And that way we can get the audience on tape and 
by audio and video can get the benefit of the questions and hopefully of the answers. Okay, young man, what question do you have? Yes, um, Plato in his writings wrote about a city that sunk into the sea about 9,000 years beforehand called Atlantis. Do you think that had anything to do with the flood? Do you think it sunk in about like that? Do you think it sunk in during the flood or what? If Atlantis existed. Right, which it may not have. It may not have. Um, and these are intelligent questions. If Atlantis existed, in my opinion, it would have been destroyed, <coughs> not at the time of the flood, it's post-flood. Remember that immediately following the flood, man had superior technology. Um, civilizations appear as superior civilizations quickly. I mean, in the record that is now decipherable by archaeological research, not paleontological research. What I've been talking to you today about is paleontology. That's the fossil record. But in archaeology, which is essentially on the surface of the globe, uh, very sophisticated cultures appear. I did a doctoral dissertation. In Magdalenian age, which is supposed to go back like 100,000 years ago, they found a settlement and they found some sketches and they were so precise and so sophisticated they actually had to hide them in the basement of a museum. Later they were found and uh, they were expressed, but the academic community in general said, well, we can't answer those, let's not teach those in the class. What did they find? They found a sketch of a lady with a hat on and the hat had a sophisticated turn. Ladies like to wear hats, you know. I don't know why, they just like to wear hats. Like a tam, sophisticated turn. The lady was wearing a blouse and a pantsuit. She had a belt on. She was wearing boots. And uh, the lady had a purse by her side which had a fold and a button. All of that was drawn onto a piece of rock. And that's supposed to be 100,000 years old. Well, what that shows is that which is rather old, dating back near the flood, but has been destroyed in archaeological records, was very sophisticated. Atlantis, in my opinion, if it existed, and it possibly did, was sophisticated but represents time after the flood, the time when most of the mastodons <coughs> were destroyed. In my opinion, most of the mastodons were destroyed after the flood Remember, immediately following, okay, see if you can put all this together. Immediately following the flood, we still had a canopy. We didn't have a firmament. Do you know the difference between the two? Firmament had the metallic crystalline constituency, it was superconductive, but the electromagnetic field of the earth would still have held enough of the water in suspension that we would have a canopy. So we would have a shielding from the uh, shortwave radiation we would still have more pressure than we have today. The pressure didn't all go at one time. Quite a bit of it did, but not all of it. We'd still have some of the effects. So with the superior genetic structure of all of those specimens, the elephants and mastodons, essentially the same thing, except for a little hair difference. Some of us have hair, some of us don't. Thank you. Yeah, well, wait, no, wait, the answer's not fully there. Some of you have hair, some of you don't. <laughs> Some elephants have hair, some don't. Um, so uh, the, there was apparently a tremendous tidal wave that was caused from eruptions under the sea that not only inundated, totally devastated Atlantis if it existed, but it went across most of the continents. And what we find uh, from the uh, mastodons, some might suggest that they were destroyed in the flood. They certainly were there before the flood. But suffocation, distended areas of certain parts of the body which occur when we're suffocating, is seen in some of the mastodons. So I think Atlantis would not have been destroyed in the flood, but post-flood in a great tidal wave that essentially covered the globe, uh, not, as, not at one time. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. First, let me say, like you, I'm a skeptic, and uh, I really like that. This is, I've heard about this before. I've read your book, and it's excellent. But one thing I was wondering is your 
the uh, denser atmosphere that existed before the flood that allowed the uh, giant dinosaurs to fly, how would that have affected, say, other birds like the albatross or these other large birds that have a lighter bone structure? It would be like, you know, you can't take an ultralight plane and fly it real fast, dynamic pressure tears it apart. Would these birds have had to struggle through the air, or how <clears throat> has that been addressed in any of these studies? Okay. It has been in principle, not in actual studies, but in this hyperbaric chamber that we're building at Glenrose, we will be able to address much more of that with actual studies, sound qualities, and uh, uh, studies of uh, buoyancy and so forth, uh, hyperoxygenation of the water table as well as hyperoxygenation of the blood plasma. Now, depending on the design and intent of a physical creature, the, um, the intensity, uh, the added pressure, actually had a commensurate climate with no winds. Mm -hmm. You might have gentle breeze, but no wind, so you wouldn't have any violence. It would be much easier to fly. So the albatross and others which have very light uh, bone structure, avian creatures uh, actually absorb air into their bones. They would be able to fly much easier and since there was no violence, <coughs> there wouldn't be wind to actually drive them down. They could simply uh, fly quite readily and with a peaceful ecological context, depending on their need, they probably would not continue to soar or dive like uh, uh, the avian reptiles would, but uh, they would have more peaceful nice. nature to their flight. Also, uh, where can I get a pair of those pink glasses? Okay, <laughs> yes. Very good question. And we make no money on those glasses. We don't make money on anything, <laughs> by design or otherwise. But I shared the formula after all of these years of research. I went to Cleburne Eye Clinic to ask them to make me a pair of glasses and see what they would do. I had no idea what they would do. So they made these glasses. And I was very surprised at the results, the positive results. So a number of other people who have seen the glasses or have visited the museum have requested them. Cleburne Eye Clinic, Cleburne, Texas. If you just call Cleburne Eye Clinic, Cleburne, Texas, and say, I, I want to talk about some pink glasses. <laughs> they have hundreds of people call. They know exactly. They'll say, oh, yes, the Dr. Ball glasses. Yeah, that's, that's what they call them. I call them the pre-flood glasses. So you just call them, and I don't know what prices they are. Uh, you can have prescription put in them. That's no problem, and they will cost, with prescription, approximately what normal glasses would cost at an optometrist here locally. Cleburne Eye Clinic, Cleburne, Texas. Any other questions? Yes. I have two questions. Uh, one. In the fossil record, are there records of like mosquitoes and chiggers and <laughs> wasps and hornets and all those things that are real pests? Yes. Let me answer that before you get to the next one. Cockroaches <laughs> in the fossil record exceeded 12 inches in length. But, not to worry, no problem. With the hyperoxygenation of the aqueous medium, the water, and the hyperoxygenation of viscous fluid context, that totally removes the threat of anaerobic bacteria. When you, when you remove the bacterial threat, Cockroaches, they're just cute little bugs. Well, <laughs> big bugs. Uh, they have found wasps in the fossil record, spiders unchanged for 300 million years in the fossil record, if those hundreds of million years exist, and they do not. But essentially, all the phylic forms vertebraic and non-vertebraic are found in the fossil record, but they're all bigger. 
they have found dragonflies, which today have a four-inch wingspan with a 36-inch wingspan. We're going to put some dragonflies and butterflies in the uh, chamber. We're not going to put any mosquitoes in there. <laughs> now, the reason being, we don't want them to get out. As long as they're kept in the chamber, no problem with mosquitoes. In the pre-flood world, mosquitoes were no problem. Why not? <coughs> it is the female mosquito that bites, and she bites just before she lays her egg. She bites out of nutritional need. She's supposed to get her nutrients from the fruit supply, but she can't get enough nutrients in our current ecological imbalance. So what she does is go for your blood. Well, before the flood, there was no need for that whatsoever. She was satisfied already. Next question. Uh, I was also wondering, I read the Genesis flood, and I was wondering if you could explain how the fossils were arranged the way they were. And Good question. This arrangement is philosophic. You don't find the fossil record like this anywhere on the face of the globe. You find these fossils, and therefore they're assigned an age in excess of 300 million years because they appear to be primitive compared to man. They're not. They're simply distinctively different. You'll find these fossils, and they're assigned a separate age. These fossils, and they're assigned a separate age. To make this appear to be true, <coughs> if, if you were to find this anywhere on the face of the globe, it would have to be in excess of 50 miles thick. You don't find it anywhere on the face of the globe. You find contradictions to all of it. You find human occupation here. You find human occupation here. You find some of these way up here. You find trilobites on the tops of mountains, by the way. You find some of these primitive crustacean forms on the tops of mountains. They're not primitive. They're just distinctive. However, if you did have one continuous column <coughs> while while you would find anomalies, because they all existed at the same time, you'd find some human beings caught in a coal bed and coalified in Virginia, West Virginia, way down here. But in general, you wouldn't find man down there. In general, you would find under natural hydraulic water sorting circumstances, you would find that sort of sorting because of the hydrology, because of the specific gravity, because of geological zonation, and because of reflex. These creatures are seagoing. These are less mobile than these. You would certainly find them caught first in the rocks, wouldn't you? You'd find these caught again. They found some sharks in the uh, Cleveland Shale, supposedly right around here. <laughs> Those sharks continued to swim until they were pressed and pressed and pressed with the context, and they're one-eighth of an inch thick. The whole shark, an eighth of an inch thick. Well, hmm. you would find certain plants that had been rooted up and caught there. Then you would find amphibious creatures which like the water but like the land as well. So they wouldn't run from the waters. Then you would find creatures that liked the waters but could run a little better. Then you would find <coughs> mammalian creatures such as these and avian creatures, birds, which had the ability to get away from the water and the instinct to want to get away from the water. Among those, <coughs> you would find these forms, even if they got caught at the same time as these, you know what happens to a human body and a cow's body when they die in water? They first bloat, and then they float. <coughs> so even if a mammalian form were caught down here, it would 
have a tendency to float until it got up there. With the decay of the electromagnetic field, how much longer do we have before the Earth becomes uninhabitable? Fifteen minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're, we're already beyond the point of danger. Mm -hmm. But, and the Environmental Protection Agency has said that in a matter of decades, one out of three will die of cancer introduced inadvertently from ultraviolet penetration. The figures show that in 3,500 years, there will be essentially none of it left. In just 3,500 years. But now, they're not going to print that. Panic means everyone would have to turn to a creator and say, you're the only hope I have. Well, he is the only hope we have. <coughs> but <coughs> that is, if it's decreasing, Linearly, we have 3,500 3, years. If it's uh, decreasing exponentially, we have a little longer. But it is already so weak, it's damaged terribly. If we had other sources of radiation coming in other than the normal sources, if there were uh, super, supernovas close at hand and additional radiation were here, men would have to live in the dens and caves of the earth to be sheltered from the radiation. Well, that's what the biblical record says is going to happen very soon. What can you tell us about Noah's Ark? Mm -hmm. Other than what's classified? Other than what's classified. It's there. We're trying to raise the money to get there and get the permit. If you have any funds to help us, help. <laughs> we, um, it is there. I will be going later this year, uh, <coughs> a team of <laughs> Ten Americans with a, a Turkish constituency will be going, and we think we can go right to the ark. What does it look like? It looks like what George Hagopian um, described it when he saw it in 1902 as a boy. He died in 1972. The ark is there. Uh, it's in probably in four components at this time. It's amazing that it is that much intact. And there are slivers of it that have gone further down the mountain. Hopefully before the year's out, you'll see some special photographic documentation of it. Let's take three more questions. Yes, a young lady. When dinosaurs, um, if dinosaurs and humans lived together, did the dinosaurs ever kill the humans at all? Good question. No, the dinosaurs are described in Job chapter 40, Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. You could probably ride a dinosaur. He wouldn't bother you. In fact, he apparently, uh, stay there and I'll try to answer it a little further. It appears that the dinosaurs were intrigued with man. No problem. They wouldn't eat you. They wouldn't bother you. They would just keep the vegetation in check wherever man was. It's like <coughs> cats and dogs. They try to follow you. If you migrate further into the, into the woods, they try to follow you. Just roaming around the area, they like to be around you. They keep the uh, heavy material uh, vegetation cut down so you'll have the nice, green, fresh asparagus. You know? Uh, it was real nice. Now, not only that, not all dinosaurs were big. Some dinosaurs were tiny. We have a full-grown dinosaur fossil form a replica in the museum, just that tall. A little grass eater. Dinosaurs like that could keep your lawn mowed. <laughs> it was a real balance. Then, uh, for you paleontologists, and one fellow has a friend in Canada, I'd like to speak with a friend in Canada about this in particular. The hadrosaurs are the honkers. They are dinosaurs like this one right here. They had cavities, and it, cavities in their skeletal crest, and it appears that they, they would give off a, a nasal honk. If that were the case, that would mean that if they came around, you would just shoo them off. You don't want them around here. The other dinosaurs would kick at them. Nobody likes to hear. Do you like to hear somebody whine through their nose? Now, what's the purpose of all this? 
The hadrosaurs have been found on every continent and even above the Arctic Circle. How does all that balance in creation? It balances like this. The regular dinosaurs like to mill around with man, but God made a special species form that was peaceful, but nobody wants a honking whiner around, so you say, get out of here. Pretty soon they get the message. The dinosaurs, regular dinosaurs, wouldn't like him either. So they kept the vegetation in check where man was not. And the regular dinosaurs kept the vegetation in check where man was. It all balances out. Um, with the greenhouse effect that you're talking about and the giant plants and the fruitful abundance, how did you uh, coordinate that with in Genesis where it says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles. And by the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food until you return to the ground. Okay. It appears that thorns and thistles were at that point mutationally added to the genetic stock of certain plants. Before that, the roses had no thorns. Before that, the thistles it wouldn't cut you if you walked through them. But nature is there said to reveal God's curse on man because of his sin, and nature does reveal that. Nature suffers because of man's sin. Nature is inanimate. It is not self-realizing. Man is. So the fact that <coughs> the curse is placed there, there was no toil before that. The fruit produced for man, you just had to go out and pick it. Didn't have to do anything, but now there is toil. Now, that does not mean that the plant ceased to grow, but it meant that there was more difficulty in harvesting them, and uh, it specifically says thorns and thistles, meaning you had to be careful of underbrush. One more question. You talked about the, the radiation deteriorating like the electromagnetic field. What type of effect would, say, nuclear warheads exploding the radiation from that, how would that affect the... Today? Yeah terrible effects. Like, like what, what, what would it take? Like how many to really affect it in a great, great way? I'm really not qualified to answer that, but one would have a fallout effect, an immediate radioactive effect for it hit, and a fallout effect on all of mankind because there is, uh, there's a buildup and we have <coughs> the jet stream that would carry nuclear radiation extensively. Now, I'm for a strong America. I'm not for disarming. But at the same time, I'm for control and conversion of the real problem, and that's the heart of man. I hope you've learned today. It's been a delight to be with you. Thank you so much.